It is 6.30 p.m. and I'd like to call the June 3rd, 2021 special board meeting for the budget workshop of the Niles Main District Library Board to order. Cindy, could you please take the roll? trustees 
who are now learning about what our library does and how library services the community, maybe they'll listen to you as qualified professionals and to residents like us who are not part of their social circle because we are all part of this area that we all call home. Thank you. Thank you. Evan Sutherland. Bussing all of our students to the library during a school day represents 
presents substantial logistical challenges, eating into state-mandated instructional time and creating real barriers for many of our special needs students. One trip alone would cost the district and taxpayers more than $6,000. We all benefit when we invest in our youth, encouraging them to grow into literate, contributing adults. Here at District 63, our goal is to, quote, empower all students to succeed in a changing world. And for many years, the library's outreach programs have helped us do exactly that. These services are critical, not only to D63 schools, but to all schools in the library district. Again, I strongly urge the board to maintain this Dr. Scott Clay, Superintendent of District okay. 63. This is from Molly Weinberg. Please do not cut the homebound service as I rely on this to get my books during the winter months. I can't get out when it's icy and would be so disappointed as I look forward to having all this reading material. Sincerely, Molly Weinberg. This is from Sharon Cook. Um, she sent this on Monday night, so that's the meeting she is referring to it. And then she said yesterday that she'd like it to be in public comment, but it came too late. Um, I found the tone of tonight's budget workshop to be fairly contentious. I couldn't really hear or see very well until the end where the meeting got more heated and voices were raised. I must say that it was surprising and concerning to witness. At times, the comments made did not even seem respectful. I hope that all meetings are not like this. I think that when people hear about work hours being cut by even a small amount, the next logical thought is, if there are cuts now, will entire positions be eliminated later? I understand people's concerns here. We are supposedly exiting COVID-19 restrictions and getting back to a more normal life. Making cuts in staffing hours at this time may not be cost effective. For example, staff who have their hours cut may have to resign their position. That position will then need to be filled with the, all the accompanying recruitment and training. What sounds like cutting just a couple of hours to one person might mean not being able to pay all their bills to another. I also want to say that the library newsletter is very well done, colorful, and engaging. I look forward to getting it every quarter. I usually hang on to it until the next one is delivered. It is not only a good resource for library programs, but for library contacts and information. During tonight's meeting, there seems to be discussion about the newsletter, but I could not hear much of what was being said. It seemed to be to put the newsletter online, but to stop the mailing it to homes within the district? As a homebound senior who often has problems with my internet service, I would like to be put on record that this does not seem like to be, seem to be a good area to economize. Many seniors are not online or have limited computer skills and might struggle accessing and reading an online version of the newsletter. Reading the newsletter also makes me aware that the library has wonderful programs and services for all ages. Library staff and volunteers are doing a great job. I have been a recipient of services through the Outreach Department's homebound program for at least six years. It has been a lifeline for me as I am completely homebound. Before I became disabled, I would visit the library frequently to use the computers, attend programs, and haul out armloads full of books as I am quite a reader. I always found the library staff to be knowledgeable, courteous, and professional. I just wanted to share my belief that the Niles Main Library is very well run and has wonderful programs for people of all ages. I think that the expertise and recommendations of the library administration and staff should be strongly considered prior to making any cuts. During these difficult times, the services of library are needed more than ever. Thank you, Executive Director Lemke, staff, and volunteers for all that you do. This patron greatly appreciates it. Sincerely, Sharon Cook. This letter is from Niles Bain, Niles Elementary School District 71. It is signed by the District 71 Board of Education, Dr. John Kosserog, Superintendent, Dr. Erica Smolinski, Principal, Ms. Laura Guaracci, Director of Student Services, and Mr. Oscar Suarez, Assistant Principal. Dear Niles Main Public Library Trustees, we are writing to share the importance and impact of the library's outreach services to our school. We are very concerned that the elimination of these programs may negatively impact our students and our community. For hundreds of our students, the school-based programming provided by the library's youth services team in our schools is their first 
and sometimes strongest link to the library. A true partner in education, the Niles Main Library has helped enrich our literacy curriculum for many years, helping to create lifelong readers. Reading for Joy is one of the best ways to create strong, confident readers at an early age. The library's school liaisons have highly specialized children's literature knowledge that they share with our students and staff. This allows students to connect with high interest reading materials at the proper ability level. Summer reading, Battle of the Books, and Famished for Fiction programs are examples of the positive impact that the library outreach programs have had on our children. The summer reading program is extremely popular with our students. A big reason for that is the librarians took time to meet with our students, share program highlights, build relationships with our students, and book talk many of the selections. Activities like Battle of the Books provide essential opportunities for our student readers to enhance their reading skills and connect with literature. Students truly love participating in all these literacy-centered events. Removing these activities would be a significant loss for our community and adversely impact our children. We appreciate you taking the time to consider our experiences, and we hope you will decide to maintain the important and vibrant connection with our community schools. So that was uh, several people at School District 71, superintendent, principal, and the board. This is from Rose. Rose Playcheck. I recently heard that the great outreach program will be eliminated. I am an 88-year-old senior whose life has been enlightened because I am able to get DVDs delivered to my Ballard Point uh, condo apartment. Please do not take away our seniors' deliveries, as that would certainly make our lives unbearable. I cannot afford cable, nor go to the movie theater physically and financially, so please do not delete this program. Delete the ones where food is served and hold off on hiring new staff. Perhaps more volunteers can help. Thanks much. How do we keep up to date on what is going on with the library? I have lived in this area for 63 years and the library has always been a godsend. This is from Maria Glazer. Hello um, to the Niles Bain Public Library District Board of Trustees. Recently, I heard of plans to cancel outreach services. As a librarian and teacher at Culver School, this concerns me greatly. The programs that the Niles Main Library currently offers students are invaluable. We have many students involved in the Battle of the Books and Famished for Fiction programs. These programs enrich our students' lives and help to make them lifelong learners and readers. The librarians at the Niles Main Public Library really work hard to know our students and are able to connect with them as readers. As a librarian myself, what a gift reading is. It makes sense to encourage more reading connections rather than less. In addition, teachers really appreciate the book bags and material delivery. Visits from the librarians also help to connect our students to the larger community. Therefore, I hope you will reconsider the cancellation of outreach services. Our students and teachers depend on them. Respectfully, Maria Glazer, third grade teacher, librarian, Clarence Culver School. This is from Jenny Pintang. In regards to the proposed budget cuts, we have lived in Niles for two years. We were only able to visit a handful of times prior to the pandemic, but we're very impressed with the selections and expansive programming. Your budget cuts inspire me to frequent another library. It is shameful that you think cutting senior and youth programming is the way to go, while at the same time hiring a wedding photographer to digitize whatever the heck and also pay him an exorbitant amount of money who, by the way, does not have a positive presence on the community social media pages. Please plainly state how you believe this will benefit anyone. We can go to Skokie, Des Plaines, Morton Grove, um, wonderful libraries that engage their community. These proposed cuts seem spiteful and they are disgraceful. It is a slap in the face to your patrons. I urge you to rethink your selfishness. Thank you for your time. What are we doing on time? Um, okay. 12 minutes. Okay. This is from someone named Irene Weinman. Just because you can slash the budget does not mean you are maintaining the mission of the library. Our library was one of the shining stars of our village. People will not want to move here. Our house values will go down compared to other municipalities with better libraries. You must rethink the disastrous course you are taking. Thank you for your consideration. Irene Weinman. 
Dial's resident for 35 years. This is from Georgia Logothetis. The new trustees have proposed a budget that is an absolute embarrassment and it should be rejected in its entirety. During the campaign, Joe Makula, Suzanne Schoenfeld, and Olivia Nujak promised to eliminate spending on what they called, quote, needless endeavors, but repeatedly refused to inform voters on what exactly they were going to target. Now we know. Their hit list includes eliminating funds for delivering books to six seniors and those in nursing homes, ending professional development to train library staff, zeroing out all online advertising, decreasing communication to residents, ending school visits, eliminating delivering books to teachers, gutting the rental of tech equipment, investing less in IT infrastructure, investing less in programming. The list tragically goes on and on. No aspect of this award-winning library is spared from their acts of incompetence and ideology. At the same time, of course, they managed to find funding for a no-bid, unlimited consulting contract for their campaign supporter. Let's be clear, this is a cruel budget created with people who have no sense of community. It's a short-sighted budget created by people who have no sense of governing, finances, or basic logic. It's scribbling in crayon by a slate of electeds who have no government or policy or management experience, and it shows. Boy, does it show. They complain about attendance and the number of patrons, but seem hell-bent on doing everything in their power to shrink this library to its four walls, where they should be investing more in marketing, more in community outreach, and more in collaborative relationships with schools and students. They have shown they are concerned with investing in only one thing, their egos. The power to create and eliminate budget items is an incredible one that creates, that requires a steady and ethical hand that is sadly like lacking from the new members of the board. This shameful budget should be rejected. The board should start from scratch, listening to the community that funds the library, the patrons that use it, and the staff that runs it. Their knowledge and expertise should chart the future of this library. Only then will the process create a budget based on knowledge, foresight, and responsibility. Our village deserves nothing else less. This is from Elizabeth Seaskin. Just two more. At last night's board meeting, Trustee Schoenfeld asked why we had so many computers since, quote, everybody has computers and everybody has access to their own information. This is false. And I think it is essential that every board member fully understands the scope and nature of the digital divide in our community. Computers and the internet are not affordable for all families. In District 63, half of the students are low income, qualifying for free or reduced cost lunch. Families that are struggling to put food on the table often do not have the extra funds to purchase desktops, laptops, or monthly internet access. But it's also important to know that just having a device or the internet is not enough. Although someone might may have access to the internet on their phone, it would be nearly impossible to use it to type up an essay or fill out a complicated application. Some patrons may have a computer and the internet, but not the software that they need to complete a project. Purchasing Word, Excel, and creative software can be very expensive. And as Ms. Wolf pointed out, there are many community members that rely on the expertise of staff. They may have a computer or laptop at home that is connected to the internet, but they need help from staff to understand how to use it. That is true of children as well as adults. Those who work with kids will tell you they may know how to record a TikTok video, but not to send their first email. And of course, technology is not limited to computers. The collection of equipment that is lent to patrons is another key place in developing digital and media literacies. Part of being civically engaged in the modern world is understanding the tools of media creation. We need our community members, and especially our children, to understand the skills of coding, video editing, and more if they are going to be not only critical viewers of media, but contributors to public discourse. That is why it is not enough, as Mr. McCoola suggested, to make these tools available only in the library to be viewed. The library is not a museum. To learn the skills of the future, our community needs to be able to use, not just look at, the latest digital tools. Some of you claimed in your campaign that you would bring the library into the 21st century. If that is your intent, 
that you must do a better job of understanding the barriers to technology and technical skills that so many in our community face. I recommend that you listen to the award-winning expert staff that have been doing the research, working with the community, and developing innovative services at this library for decades. And the last comment is from Kathy Foy. I finished reading the FOIA copy of Trustee Makula's markup copy of the budget last night. I was shocked and saddened to see that on almost every page of the account expense details, he crossed off the numbers of expenses that were listed. This includes the majority of professional development for the staff, which I believe is essential to continue as a progressive library. Current and vacant staff openings, most of the library's memberships, even to our own village chamber of commerce. Example of extreme micromanagement, library newsletter will have a maximum of eight pages. Quote, if patrons can purchase the loaned out items readily on the market, then the library will not get involved in lending those items. Unquote. We are paying taxes to the library for this service. Quote, new categories of loaned materials will need to be approved by the board. Unquote. This sounds like censorship. I could go on and on, but I am running out of time to submit these comments. I feel the new trustees are trying to gut the library from the inside out and destroy all the years of work that was put into the making the library what it is today. That is the final comment. All right, thank you, Susan. By any chance, can you tell if you can hear us better tonight than last night? Can you tell when you can't hear us? Apparently, I have people complain. I cannot tell. Sounds good. So far, so good. Okay. You know, those were such powerful comments. I know it might not be the time, but I think it deserves a comment by the president to the public about those comments. Well, actually, I was going to make a comment at the end of the meeting because we have all these departments that are here to present. So well, I will make my comment. No, we need to move on with the meeting, but I will be making comments. Um, so next on the agenda, I brought the note that Joe sent that we talked about yesterday, and okay, I thought excuse me, now is not the time. Fine, I okay. do plan on reading it tonight because I think for transparency, people need to That's know fine. what they said to us. After we fine. Gone through as the long as I get to do it. Thank you. Okay, next number five, item five on the agenda is new business for discussion and gathering of pertinent information regarding each department. 2122 budget. The um, first department up tonight is adult services, and um, the presenter is Mary Case. Thank you. I'm in public libraries now, and I still use my teaching skills every day. 
At my first public library, I helped create a brand new digital lab from the ground up, including training all staff. I served as a business liaison and taught business owners how the library could help them be more successful. When I work the desk here, one of my favorite things to do is assist people in using databases and reference books to conduct research that will improve their lives, build their skills, get, help them get a new job, be a good parent, be an informed consumer, navigate social bureaucracies so they can get health care, financial assistance, tax help, housing, food stamps, and other life essentials, which are even more pronounced now post-COVID. Or just to understand the world around them in a new way through a good book. And this is what all of us in adult services do. Programs is first on the list. If you look at the breakdown that I provided, you'll see that although many of our programs are paid, we do depend on partnerships to run our programs. Some of what we have used, some, some partners that we have used include the Attorney General's Office, the University of Illinois Extension Program, and SCORE for job seekers. More recent partnerships include the Center of Concern, who I had scheduled to provide senior lunches on a monthly basis just before COVID hit. That was an opportunity for seniors to socialize, get a good luncheon, and maybe see a movie. And more recently, staff have worked with the Lutheran General Hospital to provide free health education classes to our public. We just booked three programs with the Forest Preserve of Cook County, all free of charge. Another big partnership we have that I must mention is with Oakton Community College. Their volunteers run citizenship and ESL classes out of our building. These classes, ESL especially, bring many people into the library that would not ordinarily come here. These classes generally run right up until 9 o'clock. You will note that our book discussion programs are pricier per head. This is because they are smaller by nature. Six to 12 people is a good number for a book discussion to ensure that everyone gets a chance to contribute as much as they'd like. They are also more costly because they require more preparation from the librarians. We don't pay people to read the books, but we do pay them to develop thoughtful questions and prepare relevant reviews, author information, and interesting props to engage our readers, including maps, newspaper articles on a topic covered in the book, or other things like that. We are always looking for bargains. When COVID hit, libraries were canceling programs left and right. We didn't. We got to work. We negotiated pricing with vendors to turn our already scheduled live programs into online programs that people could attend safely from home. We worked with marketing to promote them. To our surprise and delight, this helped us reach a new audience and even more people. Three examples of popular programs that are much less costly online but still popular are music concerts, which average about $250 online, um, but are much more costly to put on in person, as all the musicians have to be paid, the rooms have to be set up specially for them, and there's more staffing costs involved as well. So they come to about between $600 and $1,000 just for just to pay the musicians. Shakespeare is $850 in person because we have live actors on this stage right here. Um, but it's only $250 online because it's lecture style. So it's more history about the time, about Shakespeare's time and Shakespeare's literature. Um, and then author visits. I really wanted to be here on Tuesday night for the first workshop. But I was interviewing Martha Hall Kelly, who is the best-selling author of the book Lilac Girls, and that was for an audience of almost 300 people. These, and in fact, the majority of our programs are attended by seniors. Many of them are on limited budgets and for their living on Social Security. They rely on our programs and materials for entertainment and diversion from difficult times. Trustee Makula, on my budget proposal next to gardening, cooking, and crafts, you had written the Discovery Channel. So I just wanted to explain why programs. Here's why. You get personal interaction. You have the ability to ask questions of a knowledgeable presenter. You get a three-dimensional experience. You can learn from the presenter, and you can also learn from your fellow attendees. If you want a more one-dimensional experience, we do have great courses that can teach things. And we also have instructional DVDs on cooking, gardening, and crafting, as well as many other things. 
Everybody learns differently. That is my narrative for the programs, and I would like to hear your question. Okay, we, what we can do is just go um, down the road. Mr. McCooley, did you have any questions or comments for her programming aspect of her? As far as the Discovery Channel, that was meant to uh, have you have something similar to that to do online rather than to have it as a, a live performance. So I'm not sure of which, are you doing this live in the library? Is that also on Zoom? Well, There's the ones that we've been doing have been exclusively on Zoom since the pandemic hit. So that would be similar to what I'm suggesting. Okay. It doesn't have to be discovery, but I mean the same principle where it's, you know, Okay. We're probably so we're, on the same page on that. Okay. But it's not interactive in the same way as one of the points is that you ask a question of a particular per person during a live program that in a canned program, either just passively absorbing it. Do you have any other questions? That's it. Okay, Trustee Jonko. I have a question. In terms of actual attendees, how do you allocate how many people actually
Um, the question number one from her is why is outreach listed as a separate department when that is not how the library has the department title? In other words, we have four discussions today and four people. Is that true? We have four, we have two departments with a breakdown of four areas. Okay, but, um, okay. Are you addressing me or are you addressing? Well, I, yeah, I, I wanted to clarify why we have four discussions and, and two departments. I'm sorry, are you talking to me? Are you questioning me? I am me? talking to everyone in this room. So, yes, so you can asking you the supervisor that? to answer yes. that question? Yes, you could answer it. No, I'm not here to answer questions. Okay. I'm here to listen to the supervisor. And if you have comments like Trustee Rosansky, please refrain till the end of the meeting after they oh. all had their chance. We need to get through this. Fine, let's do it. Please. Programming? Um, that was the question. Okay, that of course would be programming. And this is on one of the sheets that I just received. And it is about pro a program that I see that is marked for deletion. So that is appropriate time to take, right? If that's a question you're posing to the supervisor, by all means do so. Um, Who's still reading? Look, chair yoga is, is apparently going to be eliminated if voted um, that corruption. Can you make a comment about chair yoga? Because I have tuned in many times. I, I will say something, and maybe Susan wants to say something too, but I, I will say that um, as I was doing my budget, as we were doing our budget calculations today on the, on the cost per head, uh, which was very illuminating, so thank you for the opportunity. Um, I did notice that you know, Chair Yoga was one of the most cost efficient programs that we run um, because we do get such a high turnout. So the average cost per head is around just around $5. Um, so that's kind of, uh, and also we get um, multiple, multiple thank yous and please keep doing this. And I don't know how many times people have asked for extra sessions of chair yoga. <laughs> but that's one that we could regularly get. Um, I mean, Susan's seen them too, the compliments about how great it is and how necessary it is during this stressful time. Um, we even added a meditation class because we thought maybe that would, sim would be similar and that too is very um, popular and that one is totally free of charge. Um, but yeah, we chair yoga is, is very popular. And I think Yeah, well the other thing to keep in mind is that you know, we have talked about uh, not wanting to duplicate things that are done, being done across the street and you have to bear in mind we started chair yoga first. They copied us. They have Leslie Goddard coming very soon doing a program that she did here for us a year ago. So they are following our great example. They are doing things that have been popular with our patrons. But the difference is that you get charged to, to do those things at the village and particularly the people that are that don't live in the village of Niles. You know, that very dense triangle up at the top in Northfield Township that is part of our, our district, Triangle Vera and Michael Scott Harris, Michael Todd Terrace. Those people would get charged a great deal of money to do chair yoga at the village, and they are, they are paying taxes. So you know these taxpayers deserve to have those programs too. So yes, there is some duplication, and if it caused our program to drop down in demand, then of course we would get rid of it. But the demand is still there, so we're responding to what people are asking us for. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, I also investigated the cost that. Uh, Family Fitness Center charges. Um, it's actually, the Senior Center charges ten dollars per session online, twenty five dollars in person per session. Quite a bit of money for a senior, and this is what it is focused on: senior participants. Um, as far as programming, that's. All that was marked for uh, Alicia, as far as I can tell. So I'm uh, not going to mention.
to anything else at this time. We'll continue with the discussion for the other information. I had a couple of questions, please. All right, um, I, I have your programming list, and because I'm not positive which are senior programs and which aren't, could you go down the list and, and let me know so I can, I don't know that they're marked that way. They're all called those. So I don't know if these are all seniors, or programs for all seniors, or if there's there's a variation. Sure thing. Yeah, so hopefully I can clarify a little bit. Um, the, as I mentioned before, the majority of our programs are, are attended by seniors. Okay. Um, however, there are some that are particularly catered to seniors. Um, we received, uh, for the second year in a row, an age option grant right. of $3,750 to run programs. So some of our programs are covered by that, and those are specifically geared for seniors. Um, we also had used to have a program called Senior Coffee Hour, which now that no one can drink coffee together, <laughs> we changed the name of it to Throwback Thursdays because, oh, okay. because the most popular things that we offered on Senior Coffee Hour were the historical reenactments and then kind of history lectures that had a more fun, enlivening component. Um, and so those are so you can if you're looking for particularly for the things that the seniors attend, it would be um, I mean all of them. I think a lot of them go to musical concerts. Um, a lot of them, um, not the 20s, 30s, because 20s, 30s is um, and you'll notice you will notice that the 20s, 30s are also a little bit higher cost per head. We are trying to bring more people in their 20s and 30s to into the library. Oh, age. Yes, yeah, that's age, okay. indeed. Thank so you. trivia is one thing that we do with them, and we do pay an outside presenter to do the trivia because they're really good at it. Um, and then um, we do, uh, Stacy Moss Paul is the one who runs this program, but she runs like a, um, what did she call it, Nerds on Tap, where she comes up with some sort of discussion on a current topic that's trending, um, usually around media. Sure. And so that one is just her time. Um, but fewer people come to those. Uh, it's, I think it's a little bit maybe similar, comparable to the digital services uh, programs. Fewer people come, but then they get more attention. You know, um, so so those are a little bit higher cost per head. Um, but yeah, with seniors, it would be the um, the Throwback Thursdays in in particular, um, and the age options programs, chair yoga, book. Book Bites is one of our book discussion groups that's a little bit more popular than Book Buzz, but Book Buzz is almost all people over 70. Book Buzz is Book Buzz. Right. And how about Book Bites? Is that for cards? Yeah. Different crowd, same crowd? Yeah. So Book Bites is um, Book Bites is a group of people, I think it's around 15 people, who would who come to um, it, it, in normal times we would have this program at Hackney's in Glenview. And um, we would all the uh, our staff would go over there. That's Cecilia that runs that. Our staff would go over there and um, run the book discussion there, and people could eat as well. So that's why it's called Book Bites. Um, it was a partnership with the Glenview Public Library, so they have a librarian that comes as well. So um, you know they share the the cost of preparing for that program. But but we are not paying for their food. Yeah, we don't pay for the food. <laughs> I have seen Niles Historical Society book club, book group. Is that for yeah. you? You know what? We I, I apologize that that's still in there. That was one that we decided because of low attendance that we would not run next year. Um, we really tried to get it off the ground, but I think COVID sure. was the final killer of it. Um, oh. It was a nonfiction book discussion, and we tried to make it so that we could. Um, you know, have local books or books that were of local interest. Yes. yes sure. um, but we just couldn't get enough people interested. So even though it was a great partnership with the historical society, we really couldn't get it off the ground. Well, and you know, maybe that aspect of it didn't work, but maybe doing something else with the historical society, yes. you know, on, on a different level, may draw up, you know, more interest. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but let's see, Oscar party is that for seniors or is that for everybody? Well, that's everybody. I okay. think that if you if you wanted like a good faith estimate. The breakdown is probably 70 30. But 70% seniors, 30. Really? Okay. Yeah. Well, just because, you know, we want to make sure we're understanding what these programs actually serve. And the veterans is obviously seniors. Yes. Yeah. And um, 
an age option. So um, are these, a, I understand the age options grant, but I'm sort of kind of get involved with their webinars, what have you. But that's money that's applied to your, to these programs in general. But this is an additional program, so right? This money just goes towards what you're already doing for seniors, correct? We do have programs that are specifically our age options build programs, so they might oh. be kind of extra programs. But we age oh. options money this past year did cover charity yoga. Okay. Yeah. And can you choose? Um, I mean, are you restricted with that money, or can you just choose a program for seniors? It'll cover it. No, it's pretty open. Although okay. this year they had a stipulation that oh. we had to provide a technology component. Oh. So we actually what we did was we worked with digital services and we split the funds. So the total was sub seven seventy five hundred, I believe, or no seven thousand, and we split it with digital services, and they used those funds to purchase the um, hotspots and tablets that Susie mentioned yesterday yes. night. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And they're circulating those now, and that's great. And I think I believe they're providing instruction on those as well, because I think that was part of the stipulation. Wonderful. wonderful. So, so they're doing that, which is great. And then we we have a little bit more leeway in terms of what what we can offer as long okay. as it's here for seniors. Oh, good, good. It has to be marketed to seniors too. All right. And then I know this like crafts, cooking, gardening. That's not that's any age level, correct? Sure, but uh, any, but any adult. Yeah. Yeah, it's all all of it. All the things that we offer are for any any adult. Okay. Yeah. Do you have specific programming for seniors? I mean, adult programming. I mean, is that computer programming or those programs? What do you mean by that? Is that computer programming? What? So, I, am I reading this incorrectly? Sure. So you're 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 probably not seeing computer programming on there because that that type of programming is usually done in the um, digital services department. So they provide instruction around digital devices. Okay, digital. I think I'm misunderstanding all other programming, which means they're just your programs. It's not, I, you know, when I see the word programming, I think computer, but that's not what this represents, right? You said different ways, no. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. yeah. Yeah, it's fine, no, I just need clarification. And then I had one other question. You mentioned Oakland Community College. Now, I am familiar that Oakland Community College has ESL classes and apparently citizen citizenship class. Now, my familiarity with them is that they utilize the library space mm -hmm. to have their classes here, but I believe there's a fee associated. You actually sign up at Oakton, you just come here to have the class. Mm -hmm. So is that, so that would be a fee to our residents. It's not free. They would have to sign up with Oakton, pay whatever their fee is, and just happen to come to our library for the class. Is that how that works? I don't know what the fee is or if there is one and maybe Susan I, 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 I would be surprised if there was because I believe the classes are taught by volunteers. So uh, we we definitely can look into that, but I don't think they are getting charged. If it is it's a would be a nominal cost for materials or something like that. But that, that is run by volunteers. Okay, because I, I looked up oh said that right Cindy used to work on that. Um, so So Oakton does have ESL classes that students pay for, but they also have free classes. And the ones that come here are the free classes. Okay, for our residents. Okay, I didn't, I didn't know that. And then I was concerned thinking, well, if all these students or these people who are signing up at Oakton come here, then how do our residents get into the mix to participate in these classes? Okay, that's helpful. Right, but they have registration is also held here, so they come oh, here to oh, register. Good. That helps. As well, sure. they don't have to go to Oakton. Okay, great. Yes. And I'm may sorry. I add to that too? Thank you, Cindy. Uh, that we um, do feel quite quite a few questions about the ESL program. Um, so we do we are able to refer people directly to Oakton. Um, so so we're able to connect with them to how they get involved. Sure, sure. Okay, thank you. Well, those are the only questions I have. Thanks so much. Thank you. Should I move on to materials? Um, I, I, there aren't any other questions on it for programming? Doesn't seem to be. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so materials. Um, I think I left off on programming saying everybody learns differently. And I'll start on materials with everybody learns differently. Um, also, everybody has different tastes. And we are a diverse community, linguistically, ethnically, and otherwise. One of our duties as a public library is to ensure that our 
patrons have access to a wide variety of points of view. This could be opposing viewpoints around politics, for example, which can be very helpful around the election time, or not so helpful, <laughs> depending on what you're reading. Um, information about different religions, information that teaches you how to stay safe online would be written for different audiences with different levels of technology com comfort. So for important topics, we have materials that speak to everyone. Um, and not to get too bogged down with doctrine, but I did want to quote from the ALA's intellectual freedom page here, um, and, and this is a quote. We expect our people, the American people, to be self-governors, but to do so responsibly, our citizenry must be well informed. Libraries provide the ideas and information in a variety of formats to allow people to inform themselves. Intellectual freedom encompasses the freedom to hold, receive, and disseminate ideas. So I want to add to that too that actually the same goes for fiction and even DVDs and music. So people deserve access to a variety of types of literature and media for their own enrichment and entertainment. They deserve the opportunity to enjoy a variety of different creative voices. Um, Trustee McCullough, you had written um, you had written a comment on the second page of my budget proposal, and in the interest of Keeping it in context, I was hoping that I would be allowed to read the comment in its entirety and then respond to it. Is that okay? Um, we're talking about the... Okay, yeah, go ahead. Do you okay. have a page number? Sure, it's under um, adult service. Page 237. Yeah. Okay, so, so here is the comment from Trustee McCullough. Buyers of books, DVDs, and other content shall base their purchase volume to circulation volume. If circulation is low post-COVID and we keep buying books that have low circulation and we buy more books, there is no shelf space. And books with low circulation have to be taken off the shelf for new arrivals. In most cases, the library realizes little or no, little or no revenue for books removed from stock. My observation of the books in the removal bins is there were none that I was interested in reading and obviously no one else was, maybe bad purchasing decisions. So um, so if I could just speak, speak to that. Okay, um, so we, we do have a, um, I know you all have seen this before, so I'm sorry I'm flashing it again, but um, we, we have a, a standards manual and, um, and in, here, in this uh, standards for Illinois Public Libraries manual, it does say, Collection management is an ongoing process where materials are reviewed consistently by analyzing use, age, condition, timeliness, and general coverage in order to improve availability and comprehensiveness and to identify users changing tastes and needs. I know that's a big mouthful, but we are, um, when we go to library school, we learn how to do all those things. Um, uh, how, how, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how we pick books, and then I'll talk a little bit about how we read them. Um, so, we first first thing we do is we look at the numbers. Um, we run weekly holds reports to see what our patrons have on holds. We purchase according we try to purchase according to a quarter holds to one copy ratio, so that our patrons are our now patrons are not waiting too too long for any popular material that they really want. Um, we look at the New York Times and Publishers Weekly bestsellers list every week. Susan actually sends us the, the Publishers Weekly list every week. Um, we read professional reviews and base our decisions on those. Um, so some examples there are Library Journal, Publishers Weekly, and Booklist, um, all of which set aside extra good books with a star. They put like a little star next to them so that you know that the book is a quality book. Um, and then there are lots of websites that we use both to read reviews and to actually download books before they actually get published so that we can read them ourselves and find out if, find out if it's a dog or if it really is a star. Um, so we use Early Word, NetGalley, the Publishers Weekly on Sale Calendar, and that's just naming a few. Um, so in addition to the numbers, we also use our understanding of our community. Um, we have discussions with our patrons at the desk or by phone on a, on a fairly regular basis um, about what they like to read. So we have a really good sense of uh, generally what genres, authors, storylines, and writing styles our patrons like, and in some cases we have very specific knowledge of that. One example of that, which I can talk about more um, in the outreach services part, is um, our outreach staff 
are very good at and, and know very well all of the patrons that they serve and keep detailed lists of everything that they've read and liked. And so they always know exactly what they're going to want. Um, so we, we purchase according to those, those things. Um, and then for DVDs, we again, we use the whole list. We look at the hottest movies listed um, on Rotten Tomatoes and in other online locations. Um, I do want to just say this, that a lot of movies have not been released on DVD during the pandemic. Some are sent directly to streaming to reduce costs because it costs a lot of money to you know, produce all that material. So for those, we, we do cross-promote our Roku's downstairs, which have a few streaming services on them. We're able, to, we're able to point people to some new technologies from where from where we sit as well. Um, okay, so how do we lead? All right. Um, so we use quantitative measures, and that includes leading reports. The way that it's set up in our catalog in LEAP, we can actually just click on, um, uh, a, 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 like there's an area you can go to in LEAP to just see um, exactly what materials haven't served in X number of years. And our um, wonderful material services department has uh, created parameters for those based on the collection. So um, for fiction, I think it's three uh, materials that haven't served in three years. Um, so uh, books and DVDs are trendy. Their popularity comes and goes. When there's a buzz about a new book on Good Morning America or in People Magazine or The Trib, then it's going to get way more search than it will once it's been around for two or three more, two or three years. Um, we work hard to make a, a collection that works hard to earn its place on the shelves. That's how I think of it. Um, if it hasn't served in a few years, then that's an indicator that maybe we've gotten our money's worth out of it, and it's time to make room for books that do circulate better and that do appeal better to our community, as I, I hope that I've illustrated that we always have our eye on what's coming out and are able to identify those. Um, so we also look at how materials have circulated at other libraries. So like, for example, if there's a fiction book that none of the other libraries own still and it hasn't served in three years, we can definitely get rid of that one. There's, there's really not much demand for it. Um, on the other hand, if something hasn't served well, but maybe the book is still popular at other libraries, or maybe we have a feeling it might rise in popularity again, for example, if we catch one in a movie or a Netflix series is coming out, then that's one we might keep. So that's a lot. So let me stop and ask if you have any questions about this point. Well, I, I think what I was trying to refer to is that I, you could ca kind of compare what you're doing with the fashion business, uh, you know, and what I was probably referring to is, you know, when things don't sell in the store, they cut the price and eventually you cut it lower and lower, you know. So uh, the books I observed uh, didn't look like they had been read. Or, you know, I mean, they look like brand new, and that's probably the case. They, they were purchased and they sat on the shelf for five years or whatever, nobody ever took it out and they were removed. Um, is, is it possible, would it be a better idea of what, if you're not certain about a book, maybe to have people get it up through rails or something like that? Absolutely, yeah. You know, we make, per we make purchasing decisions based on the, the things that, that I sort of mentioned um, just now, but, but also um, we don't buy everything that we want to buy. <laughs> um, so we, there re we really do have a broad understanding of what's being published, and we have a broad understanding of what our, you know, our community likes, and we try to you know, intersect that as much as possible to make wise decisions. But anytime there's something that we might be on the fence about, we know that you know, if Des Plaines buys it, then we can just get it from Des Plaines for our patron. If nobody else in the system buys it, then we can get it through ILL for our patrons. ILL is just for announced patrons. So that's a, a great service that we openly offer to announce our members. I also want to say, I don't know why I didn't put this in my presentation, but it just occurs to me now. We absolutely always take into very strong consideration anything that anybody recommends to us. So if a Niles patron recommends something to us, almost 100% I'm going to buy it. Even if it's something that's self-published. Because, <laughs> you know, we want to support maybe, local maybe authors. Maybe they're the authors. <laughs> we want to support local authors. You know, that, that's, an, that's an important part of our community, too. Yep. Well, I'm just suggesting that maybe more care be taken, taken and 
what is purchased so that we, we buy books that people want to read and will continue to read. That's, that was my suggestion. Joe, I just don't understand what you think they could be doing more than they're already doing. They're already no, I think they, they possibly more careful about the buying Just a suggestion. It's an art. It's, not, it's, it's an art, and you just never know for sure what's going to take off and what's not. It's, it is somewhat unpredictable. Well, you know, there's a good chance. You know, some some of the books that are published out there, people actually paid the publisher to put them together and put them out there. Right. You know, so. Well, and we don't generally purchase things that haven't been professionally reviewed. It would. I, I only mentioned that because of the um, because if a patron requests it, you know, then we want it. Pay attention to that. That's very important to us for our patients. And can I also say too that this might help you um, understand a little bit about the books that you might see that look like they haven't been used very well. So we do purchase multiple copies of the big authors. So like David Baldacci, we get automatically we get four copies of. We have a, what's known as a standing order plan through a vendor called Ingram. Um, we also purchase multiple copies of James Patterson. Um, Daniel Steele. There's a, there's a few of them that we get multiple copies of. Those are, those are all popular authors. Very popular authors. Yeah. Years. So they, but but we don't need eight copies once the latest one is no longer, you know, the latest one. So then we have to figure, have to find something to do with those, and we um, we will uh, a lot of times we'll take them down to Outreach because Outreach has its own little collection, in particular if it's a large print. Um, but we also will will um, will withdraw them. We'll, we'll generally withdraw them, or we'll sell them in the book sale over here. So those are the things that happen when we remove books from our collection. Does that help? I don't know. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Patrons. 
when folks have won awards and so much more. Ordering does not only depend on circulation. Just because only a few people read Moby Dick or other classics doesn't mean we shouldn't have a copy on our shelves. This is directly related to professional development. If selectors are to be able to keep up on what items are current and what they need to participate in professional organizations and they need to go to conferences, they need professional development. And I think that you already explained the cycle of purchasing a book all the way through to its meeting. And also just to quote her, just because a item has lower circulation doesn't mean it isn't valuable to someone. The purpose of weeding books isn't to make money. We are a nonprofit. I just had um, actually a couple of comments. Um, just not too long ago, I requested um, copies of the weeding reports so I can get a better understanding of um, the books that we discard. Um, right before the pandemic, it was in the winter, I came in through the back doors and there were huge bins with thousands of books that we were getting rid of. And, and I was told these are multiple copies and there were five, six copies of all these books and these bins were overflowing. And, um, and that, was, that was before the pandemic and, and, and just recently, you know, there still are bins filling up with books so in order to understand the materials budget for the year and then to correlate with these weeding reports, which I heard so much about, I thought I would be able to see some information that would give me some justification. Well, the weeding reports, I was told, didn't indicate that the books were actually removed or eliminated, whatever that term is. It may have said they're not being used, but it didn't go any further to say it's now been removed from the shelf. So. They weren't very accurate, so I didn't really get the information I was looking for. So but, my concern, but my concern was um, that there were numerous copies of books bought. And, and I'm thinking maybe it's not just because it's Patterson and you bought four copies. I'm wondering if there's another reason why we buy so many copies. And that's why we were discarding them, because we obviously, at the end of something, we didn't need them. So I was just trying to understand that. If, if there is another reason why you would buy multiple copies of a book that we just end up not needing or not having, obviously, shelf space. Sure. So without knowing kind of the specifics around the titles that you were looking at, um, just in terms of the, the materials that are under my purview and adult, um, we uh, have multiple copies of books uh, that are part of our Club Reads collection. But we would not be getting rid of those. <laughs> so I'm not sure exactly what you saw, because those are very, very popular, and they circulate constantly. Um, and I couldn't tell you now, but um, there, if you could see there were five, six of these, and they were in good condition. But again, whatever the purpose was, obviously the purpose didn't exist. And I was trying to understand that. And again, my concern is I can't quote our materials budget, but it's, you know, it's a good number. We have several departments here buying books. So I just thought there was a correlation between the weeding reports that, but I wasn't able to actually get that information to determine that. So I just thought I'd ask about the numerous copies. Sure. Um, okay. I mean, and it may not even be your department. I'm just saying that's what I observed. Okay. Uh, and okay. I don't mean to put you on the spot. I'm just saying that was, I thought I had a solution to this question I had, but I didn't. Sure. No, no. I think maybe I can clarify it a little. I'll sure. Try. Um, so I, we have a set amount, we have a set amount that we are allowed to spend on materials through the year and that we are charged with spending on materials through the year. Um, that amount goes to purchase X number of materials. However, we only have so much shelf space. Um, so that is why it's important for us. Um, and, I, and I tell my staff, think of the collection as kind of a living, breathing thing. Um, and it also has a life cycle. So if it's something that's been sitting on the shelf for a while, 
but it's not circulating anymore, or it, it, it you know doesn't get very many serfs at all. Then that's something that we would take off the shelf to make room for those new books that maybe have a buzz about them. Um, most new books do. So uh, it just kind of uh, making room for the things that are more in demand. Um, and then uh, again with the multiple copies, we do purchase multiple copies to meet demand, but demand is ephemeral. So we don't have like whatever the hot book is. Like okay, here's an example of something that's not Patterson. Um, do you remember the book when the book American Dirt came out? I think this was last not last summer, but the summer before. And there was this huge buzz about it because there was like a kind of a scandal where um, the woman who wrote it was not writing from an authentic perspective. Um, so she wasn't really writing, it, you know, she wasn't really um, the, the right identity to be representing this character that she was representing. It's about immigration. Um, it got so hot because of Oprah that we ended up, I, I went online and I, or I went on our, uh, our leaf catalog and I looked and I saw, oh my God, we have, we have like 24 holds from Niles Patron Bowl. So I ended up purchasing a bunch of copies of it. Um, but that, and so the fervor lasted maybe three months and those, those copies got a lot of use, but then it died down. So then we had all these copies and where were we gonna put them? Um, sometimes, sometimes, we can identify that that's a book that would be a good book discussion book, and then we can repurpose it. And that's one thing that I've started, I've started trying to get us in the habit of doing um, with books that are good discussion books, not the pulp fiction like James Patterson and David Baldacci, but the good like meteor literary fiction um, or, or you know popular fiction. So um, so we they can be repurposed. We can certainly make better better strides there. Um, but I, I don't know if that's just to kind of explain um, maybe what you were seeing was something sure. that was a not a flash in the pan, but you know that kind of a thing where it was wildly popular, people wanted it, we listened to the people, we bought multiple copies, we wanted to make sure they weren't waiting too long, and then it was no longer popular. Does that I help you? Well, it makes sense. Okay, okay. that would be why there being so many copies, you know. So I, I totally understand that. Um, I, I could add a little bit to that too. I think um, before Mary Kate came on. Um, I, I think they were purchasing a little too conservatively. And so the holds list were getting longer and longer. People were having to wait too long for the popular things. And they were coming in and they were never finding what they wanted. And so I really encouraged them to buy what you need. And so I think then it kind of, it was a pendulum swinging kind of thing. Then they were buying a lot of copies. And so they could fill the holds fast. And then, but the other libraries had also bought a lot of things. So there just was not the demand. So I think when Mary Kate came on board, Kind of swung the pendulum back a little bit more, and now I think it's a much more evenly correct system than it was. But there definitely was a point where it was like not enough, way too much, and then that kind of more to the middle. Oh, thank you for that. I appreciate and so that was partly my involvement. I think we're finished with this category. If you'd like to move on, sure. Sure. So my next category is staffing. Um, so the staffing levels that I budgeted for uh, ensure that all three desks are staffed as much of the time as possible. Um, I know that other um, others have said this, and I, I think Susan said it last night, there's, there's really never a dull moment at our desks. Um, we get complicated reference questions that can take up to an hour or even more to answer on a pretty regular basis. Um, I, I, I would love to illustrate this by giving you some examples, so if you'll indulge me. Um, so uh, this is, an, this is a, a question that Judy answered. Um, and the question was, what, what are the languages that are spoken at home for Niles State District Library residents? Uh, Judy did some in-depth research. She used Census Bureau data. Um, and she, set, uh, she used uh, census tract numbers, which best define the district boundaries. The Chicago Census Bureau office helped identify certain tables to use downloadable data, um, which Judy charted. Um, also used, she also used the Reference Solutions subscription databases um, using their consumer snapshots feature, charted languages spoken in zip codes 60714 and 60016. Um, she got a question, uh, is the EIP economic impact payment debit card legitimate? 
um, for which she checked the IRS website for EIP information, found vetted online articles to better explain the legitimacy. Um, someone asked when the Amy Joy Donut store closed. <laughs> And there was no exact date that was that they were able to verify. It was a shop at Milwaukee and Tui, and there was a piece in the trip about the owners in 1996, and then the new Niles Police Department was built on or near the same spot in 2005. Um, they didn't, she didn't have any luck with public records, state business closings, or licensing. The Bugle newspaper archives start at 2010, so couldn't know that. But the patron was happy with the a provision of an estimated year. So that's just kind of an example of all the different places that we know that we can look. Um, a patron asked for, a patron asked how do computer punch cards work? Um, they wanted illustrations as well as basics. Um, Judy checked them the Broadhill Encyclopedia of Science and Industry, the World Book Encyclopedia, and Gale eBooks. Found articles using EBSO's, EBSO's master file and online that gave history and sample card illustrations. Um, what are the best resources for a beginner investor? Uh, checked online for a top 10 Motley Fool or Far Forbes article. Checked to see which books we owned and then sent the patron an email with, all, with the list of all of the sites and the books. Um, <coughs> called asking where to find VA aid and assistance benefits. Um, we sent them a site uh, at Veterans Administration, also scanned and emailed information from our book Federal Benefits for Veterans, Dependents, and Survivors of the Book Rumor Collection. Is, okay, is the 2012 series Men Who Built America on the History Channel accurate? <laughs> um, that's kind of cute. Found, she found online articles that cited inaccuracies and gave the patron reviews from known sources such as New York Times and Vanity, or I'm sorry, New York Times and Variety. Um, and then we've had other questions. Um, there was a patron recently who asked, who were the indigenous people of Niles and the surrounding area? Um, we did a deep dive on that one. We looked in the reference collection for information. We searched the Newberry Library, which is the, the, you know, that library in the Gold Coast in Chicago, um, for their resources and the information. Um, we have used this a little bit outdated language. Uh, she also contacted an indigenous population researcher for additional tips and information and searched Spokie Library's website for additional information. So we, um, we use our own resources, but we also look outside of what we in particular subscribe to or, um, or own. <laughs> um, a man wanted assistance locating a former Marine who lived in Chicago and may now be living in Brooklyn. Um, so we asked them for more relevant information on the individual, such as their approximate age, where they lived, any relatives and children that they had, where they believe the individual could be living now, their last known address or city. Um, again, we used Reference Solutions, which is one of our databases online, um, and, and searched that for the individual's name and those other parameters. Um, we looked at US military databases to cross-reference information, and also looked into Ancestry. Um, and see. Oh, somebody was looking for the church cemetery where a child ancestor is buried in Niles. Um, uh, we asked the patron for the name of the church in the cemetery, when their ancestor died, the name of the ancestor, the de de denomination of the church, since some churches have their own national offices and may have the information being searched. Um, search for Niles and surrounding area cemeteries located up a tent potential branched off churches since the church the ancestor attended split off and moved to Skokie, um, found contact information for Nas National Lutheran Society to help the patron with the search. Um, so those, that's just kind of a snapshot. Um, so I realize that sometimes you know, uh, when you don't, you know, when you just see someone sitting there at the desk, think, what are they doing? Are they just sitting and reading books? Well, no, we, we have questions that we feel and we take quite a bit of time um, to do our due diligence to answer them thoroughly and accurately. So, and we, we have the kind of wealth of resources at, at our fingertips. We're very, very fortunate um, to have, you know, not only the, the resources that we have here in a, in a, a pretty good sized collection, but also to have librarians who are really knowledgeable about all these different places that they can go to, to find this information. So, um, the, the other thing about working at the desk is, um, you know, in addition to the reference questions, People are always doing double duty. Um, so programmers, which mo most of our staff are also run programs, so programmers are um, frequently, you know, emailing back and forth with presenters 
or looking into what other libraries are doing for programs, or looking, you know, looking into trends in programming, um, or if they're not doing that, maybe they're working on creating a bibliography of books of interest to the community that maybe we have on display, um, or they're working on putting together um, a list to promote a list of our materials that help promote one of our programs. Um, and we have really great software called Library Aware that we make really, really good use of, and I would like to make even more use of it um, to continue uh, creating more and more sophisticated looking um, uh, book lists and movie lists for, uh, to, to kind, of, um, kind of help promote our, our programs and what we do. So um, we also, at the desk, we also uh, change formats of books from new to not new. So if you ever see us sitting there with a cart, that might be what we're doing. We're taking new books and we're making them into not new. So after they've been sitting on the shelf for you know four to six months, and we have new things and we need to display those new things, then we turn them into not new books and we shelf them. Um, or we're looking at reports or reviews or any of the kind of online uh, uh, online resources that I mentioned that help inform our purchasing decisions. So those are those are the things that we do at the desks. Um, so the the amount of people that I have on the roster um, is adequate to, to to cover those three desks on a fairly regular basis. On a regular basis, with some exceptions. Would double duty be possibly stocking books back on the shelf that are current? You know, could, that, could that be their part of their double duty? I'm really glad you asked that because I think I heard that at one of the other workshops. We, and we did yeah. discuss that. Okay, so um, I do not believe so, and and here's why. Um, if you're if you're at your station if you're stationed at a desk, you should be at the desk because if the phone rings. You have to be available to pick it up. You don't want to be all the way across the room and have to run to pick it up, or um, not even hear it at all. You know, some of our well, if there's two people at the desk, one could be putting books back on the shelf, and the other. How about getting a, a, a cell phone that would uh, that would solve that problem? I think that would that would solve it. I think they could be portable, and sometimes they have. Uh, phone systems that work within within the building. They don't have to be a you know something similar to a walkie-talkie or something like that. And and do people call the departments directly? I, I, I wasn't aware. Correct. So each 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 um, floor that we staff has its own phone, and so people will call the different numbers right. for different purposes. So the third floor is our reference desk. Um, and I'm trying. I'm trying to uh, make those. Well, here, here I, I think we're maybe looking at three phone calls a day, and I, you know, I'm just thinking, why don't we try this out and see if maybe their second duty would be stocking the, the shelves and, and click, you know, taking a straightening it out. Because sometimes people take out a book and then they leave it on top of a stack and they don't put it back. If, you, you know what I'm referring to? So, and, and you know, just go through and, and, and keep order, housekeeping. And then when they're done with that, then they're not doing de detective work for a, a client, a patron. You know, then they can maybe research on, on new programs or something like that. But I don't think you, you've got a lot of programs here. I don't, I don't know how much time you'd be spending on researching new programs. I mean, uh, not everybody sitting at the desk is, is going to be doing that research, if you, if you know what I mean. So. I'm just thinking that their second duty should be housekeeping, you know, putting books back on the shelf, and then maybe their third and fourth is just, you know, these lower priority things. Oh. Okay, can I, can I respond? Sure. Okay. Um, so, okay, so we, every hour, we, I tell my staff, get up, walk around, say hello to people, if they look like they're receptive to, to say, if they look like they need help, that's our opportunity to proactively offer our services to help them. Um, it also gives us the opportunity to pick up, so that house cleaning that you mentioned, if there's a little 
gum wrapper or something on the floor, they can pick that up. If uh, somebody left something of a personal nature, a personal item, somewhere that we don't want people to see, we can take that away so that it doesn't, you know, so that we're preserving their privacy. Um, if somebody left a, you know, a glove behind or something, you know, that um, they just left behind, we can pick it up and put it in the lost and found. Um, and it also just gives us a chance to, so it gives us a chance to interact with our patrons. It gives us a chance to do house cleaning. Um, but it also gives us a chance to just have an ambient awareness of what's going on for our own safety and for the safety of the people in the building. Um, this came in particularly handy when we were open with kind of the restrictions, which are, are a little bit looser now, but um, we were really trying to keep our public safe and we really didn't want to be a hot spot for COVID cases. So we were, um, we, I was constantly coaching my, my staff on how to use the right tone to talk with people if they have their mask down to kind of just say, you know what, you might have not even realized, but you have your mask down. So things like that. We had to do a lot more of those kind of direct interactions. So um, so we do get up and walk around and um, shelf things when they're laying around or pick things up off the floor or anything that needs to be done of that nature during those hourly walks. And the person at the third floor does that on the third floor, the person at the second floor does that on the second floor, and the person at the first floor does that on the first floor. One of the reasons that this is important to do is because sometimes there are people who are afraid to approach the desks. They are intimidated, They uh, maybe they don't speak very good English, um, and they're afraid to ask for help, or they think that we're busy. Um, and so part of what I've been trying to do with my staff is to coach them, um, and, they're, and they're, they're good at this, to go around and just make themselves available in a new way. So they're not standing behind the desk, they're available to people. Um, however, for the majority of the time, they do need to be seated at the desk in case people come by and do have a question that they want to ask. Because if someone's intimidated, but they come to the desk and no one's there, they're going to just walk away. People have busy schedules, they have busy lives, they don't want to wait around. Um, so we need to make sure that we are available to them in their moment of need. I, I think if they made a trip to the library, they're not just going to come in and, and just walk out. And what I want to bring up is what I mentioned the other night. If you go into Menards, Home Depot, Jewel, almost any store, the help is housekeeping, stocking the shelves, working at other things. If you need to ask, ask a question, you got to walk in the aisle, find them, you'll find them, and they're, they're friendly, and they'll help you find something. You need some plumbing part or something, whatever they're going for. And and that's what I think we could, we could maybe work in that direction a little bit. As their second duty in housekeeping, and, and if they can't find you at the desk, they're going to look for you. They're not going to go home all the way to Ballard and uh, Central you know, to uh, uh, up in that neighborhood there, you know, because nobody came to talk to them, but, you know, they'll, they'll find you, they'll ask questions. Well, I, I, people, uh, and a lot of people, too, want to serve themselves. When I come to the library, I, I have an idea what I'm looking for, and you know, I know how to find it. I don't want somebody, you know, thank you, you know, no thank you, I, I know what I'm looking for. I'll, I'll, you, know, you, know, you know, you know what I'm saying? I don't, I think most people, serve themselves here. I don't think they, they come to the desk and ask for help. Now, Ms. McCulla, she's the expert. She knows what people need. She's the one that right, closely I, observes what the patrons I, need and has a lot of information. You say off the top of your head you only get three questions, but you don't know that. You're making that up. She knows what the needs are. I, it just feels very disrespectful to me. My observation, now maybe I come on to snap for busy but in the library most of the time people are not helping somebody else at the desk so I mean, that's why I'm thinking their double duty could be the, the housekeeping too not all the time once it's done you just go back and st stay by the desk that's all Keep track 
and they want you at the desk when they have questions or they have a book they want to take out or whatever. So I agree with you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I'm a librarian also and have served at the desk and I don't like the idea of running back and forth, back to the shelf and back to the desk and back to the shelf and back to the desk. No. It, it, try it sometime, Mr. Rupula. My question is about um, your sheet, which we just got today. Um, you indicated staff two service desks and assist on another for 70 hours a week that the library is open. Note that this responsibility alone would take four full-time staff members without doing any of the other tasks listed here. Uh, Mr. McCullough has it crossed out from 70 to 54 hours. So actually my question is to Mr. McCullough, what happens during the 54 hours? Can you clearly tell me how on a day-to-day -day basis, how 54 hours creates a schedule for the library? Right now we're operating in 54 hours. I don't, I don't see what your, what your problem is. We, we could shift the hours around and maybe open at noon time and stay open until 9 at night instead of 10 to 7 on some of those days. And are you not anticipating a change in attendance? Now we, we don't know what's going to happen after COVID. It's no. not, and that's why we there's don't, no reason to we be don't open uh, more change than the now. hours a week either. I think we're off the subject from. Well, actually, was on the same sheet of paper. It's really hard the way everything's done. Written over? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Do we have any more questions for our supervisor? No, but thank you for your thank you for your information. And then you're not finished, are you? No. No. Okay. okay go on. Go ahead. All right. Um, I, I have two more pieces for the adult services uh, section, and then I will talk a little bit about outreach. Um, so the, the next section that I was asked to speak about is a professional development. Um, and, I, and I do want to say that others have spoken about this at length already, so I don't want to take too much time here. But I do want to underscore that we, we get tough questions, so we have to be one step ahead of the public in terms of how we find accurate information and also what resources out there are available for us to purchase or you know or refer to in order to you know to get the accurate information to the patrons. And we also want to be good at recommending books to patrons because people come in, you know, probably the top question that we get at that second floor desk is, I just want a good book. I just want a good book. So this is where what we call we call it the reference interview, <laughs> which is a fancy way for saying having a conversation with someone about what they like. Um, so, you know, we might start that by saying, well, what, you know, what was the last book that you read and that you loved? Um, or if they don't read very much, what was the last movie that you liked? Um, so, you know, we, we, we have different ways that we can, um, you know, uh, proven ways that we can kind of tease information out of people to help, to help them pinpoint their needs, whether that's informational needs or reader-related needs. Um, and then not to mention providing interest, interesting and relevant programs to our community, et cetera. Um, so professional conferences, like uh, in particular the PLA, but ALA too, um, but the PLA gives us opportunity to learn from other public library professionals, it gives us a chance to get tips and tricks, learn about trends, learn about projects or new services that other people have done that were successes, learn about projects or, serve, or new services that other people have tried that were not successes, so don't try them. Um, and also, we get very um, hands-on advice on how to connect them. So it, saved, it actually saves us time. Um, and the idea is that, I mean, just basically, the idea is that we are always on the lookout for new ways to serve our communities using new technologies, new resources, and new trends. It's kind of 
of a living, breathing thing, so we need oxygen for it. And those conferences are that oxygen. That's all I have to say about that. I should mention that the uh, reason there are several things here for chamber events is that her department has a business librarian, and the business librarian uh, inter -like, likes to get to know the members of the business community, so they go to some of those things. And that's the same person who coordinates with um, our local, like our area score and um, other kind of business related, uh, or other businesses to, uh, you know, kind of help, help provide job related programs. Um, and other, other programs that are, are of interest to uh, people looking for jobs or people who are interested in investments or other finance sorts of things. So it, it's a relationship that takes time to build. So she builds those relationships while she's at the chain of meetings. Thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions? notation at the bottom which indicates that all of this will be eliminated. I find that very disturbing that someone would even think of eliminating professional development. <coughs> and the names on that thing on the bottom happen to be Joe McCullough and Carolyn Durbluck. Thank you. going to conferences, we need to maintain our memberships because that makes programs available to us online. So if we have an ILA, if we have a PLA membership or ALA and PLA membership, um, we maybe we don't go to the conference this year, but we can still take part in um, workshops that they offer and online education that they offer at a deep discount because we're members. So it opens it opens more cost effectiveness up to us. If the library, I, I believe it was five hundred dollars for the POA and they pay five hundred for the ALA. If they belong to that association, does that allow the individual individuals in the library to then go online and, and source that information, yeah. or do they individually have to uh, buy a uh, subscription? Well, they would, they would, uh, okay, so a membership to the PLA would not necessarily give you access, it would not give you access to a conference, an online conference. No, no, I'm, still, I'm saying, let's say you were sitting in your station at your desk and you were speaking to more and then wanted to, you know, look up something that pertaining to libraries might, might have been. Joe, can you speak a little closer? It's hard to hear you. Would, would, you be, would you be able to have access to that ALA or PLA site because the library paid the $500 membership or would that person have to have paid their... Uh, it, is usual, it is usually individual memberships and the library has an institutional membership to ALA but not to PLA. You don't, we don't belong to any of the divisions. Question is, can, would they have be able to source that information with the ALA uh, membership? No, I don't think so. I don't. Yeah, but possibly for some things, but in general, it's they're looking for an individual membership. They have a like a wealth of resources, so there may be some things that are available just on their website. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I, I'm not. I'm not without knowing exactly kind of what you're. To, I'm not sure how to answer that. Another point, um, if there's a hot item at a conference in Washington, D.C. or somewhere, don't, don't you think that the word would get around on, on the, uh, on these, uh, you know, 
subscriptions or in, in some other way that uh, the library would hear about it instead of having to uh, travel to the conference. Okay, so m maybe, um, but let me just share a personal uh, note. Uh, when I go to conferences, the most meaningful part of the conference is the end of every workshop when I wait in line to talk to the person who gave the, the lecture and I can ask them all the questions that I have. I tell them about myself. I can give them my card. I can get their card. And then we're, we're connected and I'm able to ask them you know, further questions. It's something that I, you know, what they presented on is something that I want to consider for our own library, then I can bring that home, talk about it with my staff, and then also have a contact who's already done it who I met at this conference. And likewise for the people standing in the line with me. I can chat with them while we're standing in line. We can share ideas. Have, have you been to any conferences? Yes. What What's the, uh, what, what uh, is the most significant uh, thing you, you brought back here from? Well, I haven't been to the PLA in a very long time because I had a baby two years ago. <laughs> and I haven't wanted to go. Um, I was pregnant and I had a very small child and, and they only offered every two years. Um, but I, but everything at the Public Library Association conference is directly relevant to what we do. So um, not having been to one since I've been here, I would have to think about that for a minute. Um, Oh, that's okay. Let's move on because this is dragging on quite a while. We got another. Let's just say I was really hoping to go this year so that I could get some of that stuff because I know it's there. <laughs> yes. Uh, my question is pertaining to grants, which our library tends to get quite a bit of. If we do not have ALA, PLA or ILA membership, what's the likelihood? Because don't they ask questions if you have that membership when you put in your grants? And what's the likelihood of us not getting grants or getting lesser grants because we are not members? That's, if I could respond to that, I actually asked um, Rich last night to look into that because he received numerous that it is a possibility that if we didn't somehow our our affiliation with attending or not attending could affect it but he's not sure so I'm waiting to get that information from him so we'll have that I'm not referring to the conferences I'm referring to the membership which is a different thing well membership conferences it's all the same no it's not have... conferences they go to a specific location which you guys have stated you don't want people going to conferences but you're also stating that they cannot or should not belong to the organizations and my question is pertaining to the organization not the conference thank you that's all covered under my question with well, Rich, so i believe we'll get clear okay trustee olson Costs include the magazines, like both of this. I think that those. I think there's a separate line for that, but maybe Susan wants to correct me. Yeah, uh, there are magazines, book lists that we suffer. Oh, the book lists. But there, are, these are magazines, the ALA magazine. Yes. Yep. And that's where you find information that help you in book selection. Correct. Yes. So this is actually part of your job. An important part of your job is to have this printed information to be able to go previews and articles about your position. Correct, yes. That, that's why they are so important. That if you don't let them know how people will be able to do their job if they don't have their material to work with it. I just had one question. Um, somehow we were talking about ALA membership, and I believe I heard there's a $500 membership, but that's for the library, but then there are individual memberships. Right. Could you explain what that means? 
uh, the library does have an institutional membership to ALA and ILA, uh, but then individual librarians, can, uh, I think it's always been a perk uh, for full-time librarians to join ALA and in one of the divisions and that they then get the magazines that Diane was referring to and they have access to the list serves where they can exchange information with other librarians and top, hot topics are coming up and um, it, it's uh, just a, access to a lot of different resources through that. Okay, so the institutional they, membership honestly doesn't offer a great deal to us. It gives us one, like we have one copy of a magazine that can go in the staff room for all of the staff to read, but, um, but it's more of just being part of an organization. So the individual memberships are where they, they get to choose um, a division that they'd like to be a member of? Right, and in a PLA year, they almost always choose PLA because that reduces the price of attending a PLA conference. Okay. But it depends on their particular job. Like the, tech, the people down in material services would belong to, I forget the name of their division, but it's more to do with cataloging. Uh, children services are joining the Association of Library Service to Children. So, and then everybody might want to join the PLA, but you have, you have to pick one. I, for example, belong to four divisions, but I pay for the other ones myself. So just just because I'm, I'm still up there, there's sure. an ALA membership and a PLA membership. You yeah. get to choose which one. ALA is the umbrella for all of the divisions, and then there are divisions within ALA for PLA, Association of Libraries. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, all association. Association. okay. I so thought they were separate. All right, I got it. Okay, thank you for that clarity. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Would you like me to move on to outreach services? Please do. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. So, um, outreach doesn't run any programs as we think of programs as in events. So. Um, I don't have any program for each at this time. Uh, they do not, they also don't have a line for materials because they mostly receive our large print discards, so things that don't fit on our shelves anymore that we purchase multiple copies of, um, and then other popular discards. And they use those to furnish um, their bulk loans and also to uh, loan out to, to individual homebound patrons. So uh, just to, to give you kind of a snapshot of um, what the outreach outreach folks do, uh, outreach, I just want to call everybody at Dublin Outreach because we're one department, but you're asking to, for me to just talk about outreach. So, all right, so outreach, uh, we have about 100 pa patrons that are homebound or in need of home delivery services, whether that's for a chronic condition or something that's more temporary. Um, uh, uh, for, for example, a lot of our patrons are like Ms. Sharon Cook, who had written in and Susan, <coughs> Susan read the le her letter earlier in this meeting, um, where she's completely homebound. So we have, we have a lot of, of patrons that are like that. Um, so about, about 100 people that we deliver to every four weeks. I will say that we used to deliver to them every two weeks, but I wanted us to be a little bit more efficient, so I did ask that we that, uh, back on that and um, and that gives them more time to be on the desk and help with the desk and it also gives us gives me time to cross train them so that they are um, able to do more things that the other adult services librarians do um, they also uh, on a daily basis um, or on a weekly basis I should say takes school materials to teachers at, at a variety of schools in the in the district um, so they deliver to a number of institutions, including up to nine nursing homes. So the ones that are on the roster right now are Avanti, Glenbridge, Grosse Point Manor, Landmark, Niles Nursing and Rehab, the YMCA, St. Andrew, and Barb and Triangle. Um, so some of those places, because of COVID, had shut down completely to outside visitors, so we had to haul all of our services to them during that time. Um, however, my staff, Leslie and Karen were still visiting them by phone calls. So they would make phone calls while they were working from home. That's what they would do. They would call them up and say, hi, how are you doing? And the patrons would say, when are you coming back? <laughs> are you calling to tell us you're coming back? 
because they missed their books and their DVDs. Um, so, uh, uh, so right now we are delivering to we are delivering to Triambra, Embark, and um, what's the other one? Uh, no, Landmark, Landmark are just planes. Those are the three that we're delivering to regularly. And I will say this: today, just today, this was so interesting. Um, the new activities director from Elevate St. Andrew came in and said, I would like to introduce myself to you, to Karen. And Karen came out and she spoke to her and she said, I think we're ready to have you start coming back to deliver now. Um, she said, we're, you know, our COVID rates are way down. As long as you can prove that you're vaccinated, we'd love to have you come in. Um, so uh, so they're, they're chomping at the bit. They came to us to, to ask for that. Um, so we'll, we'll start adding them back in to our delivery schedule as well, hopefully. Um, Karen and Leslie deliver to individual patrons in these nursing homes as well as uh, uh, bulk loans. So the bulk loans are between 35 and 70 books, uh, popular materials, that we add to the institution's library on loan. So we put that either in on bookshelves that are either in, a, in a, like a designated library in the nursing home or they're in a like a community space where everybody has access to them um, so it's kind of like a satellite library um, so, so um, when, when Karen and Leslie are not delivering or selecting books to deliver um, or coordinating with patrons on what they would like speaking to them on phone on the phone um, about their preferences putting things on hold for them um, pulling materials, then I have them, I've been having, like I said, I've been cross-training them at the desk more. Part of that came out of the sheer need to do so because during COVID when we were working on a um, team, uh, kind of a team structure, we were operating with uh, much fewer staff on any given day. So uh, my the people that were on my team were Karen and Leslie, and Leslie at that point was brand new. I think she had been at the library for a week when COVID hit. So Karen wanted to still continue training her, even though she wasn't necessarily going to be doing the deliveries. She wanted to train her on outreach operations. So, um, so I had I had them, and um, but I, I needed for them to also because we were so short staffed. I needed for them to also be on the desks and answer phones and help patrons and answer you know, answer questions and help um, create. Um, contact-free pickup bags so that people could you know pick up their materials so I did end up cr uh, cross training them and I found that they were very very good both of them at, at working up with us and so um, so uh, I, I'm trying to get them more involved with desk work but at the same time the work that they do delivering to patrons in the nursing homes and the patrons who are homebound is very very important and we get a lot of a lot of compliments on it. All through COVID, we had um, all kinds of, I got all kinds of emails um, and all kinds of uh, compliments through Karen about um, what a lifesaver it was to have somebody come and deliver things to them, even if they couldn't stay in chat because of, you know, risk of exposure. They were just, um, they, they got they got a lot, a lot of praise and they got a, a lot of props and um, and it was a really important, it, it is a really important service. So um, that's a little bit about staffing. I, I want to make sure I have enough time for questions. So I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. First, first question. You take a place like Infark, I think these people are paying, I don't know, maybe they get state assistance or something, but the cost is probably four or five thousand dollars a month in some cases. Uh, I think my, my idea was have these institutions give them a card that says special card, let them pick out 100 books for their library, let them pick out what they want, or you can pick out books for them. They come and pick them up, they take them, they can switch them back and forth. They can take orders for their, or you can take orders for their people. They can come instead of once a month, they can come once a week and pick up books for their tenants or whatever you want to call them and bring back the books that they're finished with. And I think probably in some of these cases, some of these people are short term. They may, their relatives may pick them up and take your book along with it. You may not get your book back, I don't know. I don't know, what, what, what's the loss factor in, in, in that? In that uh, I 
on your outreach? How many, how many, what's your percent? Two percent, three percent? I think it's, I think it's maybe two or three percent. I think that's right on. Actually, Karen and Greg and I were talking about that today, and that was, that was uh, what we decided on. I see any time a book gets lost, because Karen emails me and um, Athena, and so I see any time something is lost, and it, there's just, there, there's not that many. So, so if, if we had Embark come and pick up the books and the, the people selected them somehow on, on the phone or online or at the location there and they came once a week they get better service and if the books were lost Embark would be responsible for the books and we wouldn't have the loss and they'd get better service and we, it would cost us less and that's my thinking makes a lot of sense. Um, America could, could not get have access to our records. She did mention that they have records on what everybody has read and they know what has been checked out before. And Mark cannot have access to any of those kinds of things. It's you, all you mean, the and confidentiality. You, you don't want and these people to select their own books? You want to select the books for them? Is that what you're saying? No, I'm saying it, it's, they just have a whole system for how they do things. And it would be very complicated. I mean, I, I, you're saying a person from Embark would come here and pick out books for all the people, but no, they don't no, have the that's information. Not what I said, I said they, they have a library. I, I believe in most of these places they have a room where it's a, a library where they have popular, right. maybe 100, 200 books. I think she mentioned something like that. And then the individual tenants or nursing home residents uh, could embark could help them select books from they would have maybe computer access to your books or uh, maybe they have they're, they're, they're looking at some book they saw in over or something and, and they'd like to see it and they'll order it and embark will come here get the book and, and take it to them they won't have to wait three weeks to get it they get it and when they're done in a week or two or four whatever it gets returned and, and embark returns it they, they maybe do the service one, like I say, once a week instead of once a month. And, and, and it's something we could try. And, and, and we can't, uh, you know, nothing ventured, nothing, nothing tried, nothing ventured, nothing gained. So uh, I think it would be beneficial to the library and, and to the taxpayers and everybody. Well, I, I would like to just comment that I don't. Um, let me just ask: Are you are you say, are you saying that somebody that works at Embark should come to the library with a list of books that they've procured from the they, residents they, that they live? Could, they could tell you what books they're looking for. You can pick the books. They'll come up, and pick them up, and take them to the individual rooms instead of the people traversing the halls there and and, and dealing with the uh, people who might be sick, and maybe your people may get sick too. Maybe spreading something. I don't know. Best best thing is to have have the let embark do it. Why why should we go go to that and, and they would people would get better service, wouldn't they? Well, okay. So um, it's not worth trying. There's a well. Um, I just I'm not sure who at Embark would do that because they they have staff there who are already doing things and, and I, I, it sounds like what you're proposing is to take a full-time job plus a 19-hour job and give it to somebody at Embark who doesn't We're have the history and the knowledge there. of the they'll, library they'll find and somebody the to help their people out there. I'm sure they got uh, concierge or somebody that, that goes out and gets stuff for people that can't get out and shop. Or, well, I, I do know that one of the things that seniors, in particular seniors who are living in nursing homes, struggle with is isolation. Um, they don't have family that can come. That, that's generally something that people's family would do for them, but these folks that live in these nursing homes don't. A lot of them don't have family. There. I think you're making the Are you suggesting that the Niles Library employees are their family? Is that what you're doing? No. No, I didn't mean to suggest that. I'm sorry if I did. No, I just I just meant to say that that, that what well 
like what you're what you're it sounds like you're saying that there should be a job at Embark that there should maybe be two jobs at Embark that just help liaise between why, why the lines. Why don't you that before we start jumping to conclusions? Talk to some of these nurses. Okay, to see if that's not how we speak to the staff. Help with people. Um, I think, Joe, that your idea is about or just even having different ideas is great. I'm, I'm all about having new ideas and trying different things, but what I would like to suggest for all of us is to talk about these ideas together before we make any decisions about budgets and maybe also speaking to the people at the places that are affected. So maybe we could talk to Embark and see how we could work that if they have that capability even before we assume cut things. Yeah, I mean, Can I just ask one question? In terms of individuals that are being selected for books and materials, how many individuals do you actually deliver to? Uh, I, it's a, around 100. Now, where exactly are the locations? They're within our district. Just in our district? Yes, so? just in our district. And our, I, I will add too that our one of the other things that our staff do is they're very strategic around the routes. So they want to make routes that are the most you know efficient and the quickest. Um, and they are also balancing in the schools too, because um, the schools do need those books um, to support their curriculum. I, I like to point out there's a difference between people that are homebound at home and those that are in the nursing home because you've got a lot of people there helping them. At home, they definitely need somebody to call on their Nursing homes and sister living is a different story. Trustee Rodinsky. Yes. Thank you for bringing up the home model, My question is about the home model. Do we have many that are homebound? Because you said 100 people. To me, that's quite a few people. Are the majority of them in facilities, or do we have quite a few that are homebound? Quite a few are homebound. Thank you. So therefore, they should have the services. Thank you. Thank you. Just the old thing. Okay, I think the suggestion is homebound. We're going to service and nursing homes. We're not going to service. That's what I hear. There's, I mean, just me saying it, can, can't you see that that's wrong? They are both groups who pay taxes to Niles. They both deserve the same services. which 
It's a great resource for paraprofessionals and can cover a lot of information and new ideas for home delivery and obviously services to seniors. Thank you. I, I had just a couple of um, comments. Um, thank you for breaking down outreach services um, because I feel it's important for, for us to understand exactly what services we're providing. Um, and, and I'd like to recap by clarifying some mistakes that are repeatedly being spoken here in public comments, uh, on Facebook, and, and, and everywhere else. Um, it was never decided that we were going to eliminate outreach services. The recommendation was for nursing homes that are staffed, and their staff is, is there to provide services for their, their residents, that they pick up other items for them, that we could consider having them pick up their books, and Joe said it could be even more efficient or more often than we're scheduling to do that. But the fact is, it is a service that would be in addition to the many services they offer a lot of their residents. Now, you mentioned nursing homes. Do, do you only go to nursing homes where it's rehab individuals, or do you go to like senior living buildings as well, where they're not necessarily rehabbing or ill? Correct. Yeah, there's both that are in that list. Can you hear me? I can. Yeah, okay. There's both in that list that I had read earlier. Uh, uh, Embark has, um, I think Embark has both. Okay. Um, and then there's one that says Niles Nursing and Rehab that's mostly yeah. there. Triumvera, is it? Triumvera is not actually a nursing home. Triumvera is a uh, condo. Um, okay. I don't know what to call it, but it's like a, a, it's all the way up in the northern part of the district, um, and they've got uh, a little community area where we uh, where we were able to drop off both loans. So it's a condo? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, well, and the there point I was... senior residents? Is there anything you consider there? There are a lot of seniors that live there. I, I haven't heard of it called a senior residence, but okay. I think that's the idea. And I think it might be low income as well. Low income for sure. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Low income. All right. And, and so I just, I just wanted to clarify, we never intended to stop delivering to homebound individuals and I think it was so sad that because we started these false claims that all of these people actually sent the emails were so distraught thinking that we were going to eliminate services to people who are home and unable to help themselves. It's a tragedy but I just need to make sure we're very clear that was never our intention. It was never stated anywhere and again this is an information gathering discussion. And now that I realize that outreach services includes homebound, which is separate from the nursing homes, there are actually 100 patrons that are homebound individuals that you serve. Obviously, we could never cut them. We never would want to, and they certainly can't come here. But to suggest the possibility of uh, MBARC or Landmark having someone on staff Provide services that may be able to pick up, pick up their books here on a regular basis. I don't think it is out of the ordinary, and actually, it's, it's been recommended a few times in the past. But um, the nursing homes, we would never stop the look, we would never stop servicing them. We're just trying to come up with a different way to get their books dropped off and, and picked up. So, I just want to make sure I'm clear about that. Now, taking materials to schools for their curriculum, could you? Explain that a little more in detail. I think that the better person to do that would be Ariane, who's coming in now. Okay, the one who's waiting for her department. That's she's fine. the brains of that operation, and we're the brawn. <laughs> no, that's so fine. They pick the books. The kids base picks the books, and then we actually we take them. Okay, so you're like the they so okay. they do the selecting. They do the sure. communicating with the teachers. No, that's fine. We I can certainly yeah. wait. Okay, well that's that's all I wanted to mention, and, and I want to thank you for all of your details. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I please ask something? First of all, I'd like to say thank you. And I'd like to say the reason people got these ideas about outreach has to do with the information Joe handed out, everything crossed off, and big zero. 
And if you didn't want people to have those ideas, maybe Joe shouldn't have done that. Thank you.
Honor. Yes, I guess we are ready to begin. Thank you. All right, a special thanks to the patrons and community professionals who have reached out to us at the library in this time of uncertainty. Those on the board have the privilege, honor, and duty of supporting staff as we provide modern and even library service to all households of unincorporated displays, a portion of unincorporated Glenview, and the entirety of the village of Niles. We as staff who provide this also recognize that privilege, that honor, and that duty both to act as professionals and stewards of the community's valuable resources. We extend an openness to help you understand what we do in satisfying those needs of the community in a professional manner. My full-time youth services staff has 90 years of combined experience in youth services in a library setting and 43 of those years in Niles. So I'd like to extend my word that we are doing our due diligence as professionals to serve the people of your community. I'd like to open with programs. I'll start with uh, a special thank you and acknowledgement of my co-worker and assistant department head, Sarah Muskovich, who's sitting here tonight. Sarah has prepared the bulk of this program audit, and I would like to state for the record that the volume of work requested would most likely take staff two to three months of detailed attention in addition to our regular reviews. Additionally, there was a large number of questions submitted through Greg to Trustee Derwood that were not answered directly. I do have the emails here. Greg asked these questions so we could do our best chance to give you the information that you had asked for in a timely and meaningful way. And her responses to those questions were dismissive and did not help me do my job. What questions did I overlook? I can read those for you. Would you like me to? Sure, because I thought my answers uh, covered all of them. You know, how about we email that to all yes, the trustees please. so you can please. see, because I think people are a little tired. It's whatever works for you is fine with me. To give a shorthand overview for all stakeholders, the Youth Services Department has asked for $29,020 for the upcoming 2021-2020 budget year. What could we possibly do with all that money? I'm so glad you asked. We plan an array of year-round story times that happen week in and week out. Evening family story time occurs every Tuesday night at 7. This allows working families to visit the library in the evening hours and reinforce literacy as a value. Rise and Shine is a weekly workforce of a story time that when we are in full swing and in person, fits best in this Commons meeting room with its amount of dedicated vans and all the required stroller parking. Again, these are families reinforcing literacy for value. And to round out the programs we offer week in and week out, we have a story time for infants and caregivers. This is a chance for new littles and their caregivers to venture out to a gathering of their peers and share in stories, songs, and, and rhymes. Again, reinforcing literacy as a value. Just for note, the baby story time did switch to a virtual offering during the pandemic and has been well attended by both caregivers and infants and offers the chance for a household if they have a napping uh, you know, three or four year old to still engage in literacy with their little Many of the uh, efforts that my staff made to flip to virtual programming will remain in the lineup. There's a cornucopia of other story times that we also plan and produce as we aim to serve all ages at all stages of our youngest patrons as they develop. We put on a number of theme programs, including breakfast bingo, listening for and identifying numbers wrapped in clay and topped off with a donut bowl is good learning fun. B52, B52, five in the tens place, two in the ones place, B52. We have programs on bridge building. Geometry is not just for high schoolers. We have pizza story time. How many slices can we get out of that pie? And we offer a full array of Wonderground programming. Wonderground is home of inquiry and all the tools that we use to figure out answers. Much of our programming is the direct result of parents asking directly for help for their children. 
My little one doesn't much like to read. Any ideas to get them engaged? Why, sure. We can make reading fun. You know how the grown-up book clubs where moms and dads get to get together and talk about books with a glass of wine? Instead, we crack open a juice box, order a pizza, and lead them through a lunchtime book club. I had a number of parents come up to me as patrons were returning to the library and thank me directly. One mother said, you saved me. I don't mean me personally or youth services, but the library in general. We provided a number of programs for families who were desperate for interaction, and they have expressed their thanks and gratitude. Another perennial question that we get at the library is, can my child volunteer for you? In 2018, we serviced over 2,180 hours of volunteer opportunities for youth in the community. In 2019, we serviced uh, 2,029 hours, and in 2020, we serviced 107 service hours. We offer programs that engage children in writing, in reading, in thinking, in problem solving. We don't charge, and we're open nights and weekends. We engage them through their schools, partnering with public and private schools, and even homeschoolers to put on Battle of the Books and Reading Challenge, and have been doing so for 40 plus years. Parents watch their kids on stage who once sat on that stage themselves. Give us a few more decades, and we'll have those parents bring their grandchildren. For many kids, this will be the only team that they are part of in their school careers, and you are part of helping bring that into life. We have many multi-generational interactions at this library. Second Sunday, World Language Storytime, which was previously offered in Serbian, Russian, Arabic, Gujarati, and currently offered in both Polish and Spanish. I'd like to take a moment to address the public concern about programming in world languages. Please rest assured that we strive diligently to serve those patrons who speak a language beyond English. We know that East Main 63, the largest district that we serve, has over 65 languages spoken in, the, in their schools. 65 languages. If budget, space, and available text were no issue, we would love to support all of those languages. But we recognize rational boundaries, and to that end, our world language collection and new services has materials in Arabic, Italian, Japanese, Korean, Polish, Russian, Serbian, Spanish, Tagalog, and Urdu, to name a few. We know the importance and value in offering a program in targeted language in, in a targeted languages language, excuse me, and we seek staff that can provide for that. We had a non-native Spanish speaker retire a few years back and sought applicants with that skill set. And luckily, we have a native full-time assistant who has a wonderful story time presence. She provides translations and promotions and recently hosted a virtual bilingual story time that had 60 participants. As a full-time staffer, she is also available for interpreting when there's any department in need. In recent years, we've added parent and educator programs to the lineup. The parenting programs are filled with appreciative families who are very happy to attend as a family. One parent is in the program and the other parent is with the little looking at books. The teacher workshops that we provide are partially state-funded presenters who offer early childhood education workshops at the library for preschool and daycare teachers and those staff who need to earn professional development credits. Each year, these educators are required to earn a certain number of credits. So the library is stepping in to fill that void. Many attending educators have noted how helpful it is to have access to a workshop that is close to home in the district. And having those educators come into the library has also helped increase the awareness of teacher library cards, parents and teacher collections, and our school loans program. The workshops are not restricted to just teachers, as registration is also open to community members, like parents who might be interested in more specific information. An industry standard, and I'd like to also say that all of my uh, coworkers' presentations have shared with you these industry standards. These are not just expressions of our vision of library service. These are industry standards. We are members of local, national, local and national professional groups, um, and we 
follow these standards. A standard of any engaging youth services department is their summer reading book. Every year, we start planning in October for the following summer. The theme varies each year, but the goal is to engage our community in a browsing thematic adventure where reading is the ticket to participate. Years past have seen giant game boards, sandboxes, shooting baskets through a toilet seat with a wadded up pair of tidy whities The whole point is to get kids excited, to get them reading, to get them engaged. This summer is a little different. Like last year, the entire program will play out virtually. Beanstack is an app for families to download on their device or access through the website. This year, the goal for kids is to read or to be read to for 10 hours. Summer reading is our most popular program. In 2019, we had 1,758 participants. In 2018, we had 1,820 participants. We did have a dip in the program last summer due to COVID, and many kids actually didn't even realize that we were doing summer reading. And so last year, our participant count was 412. This year does look to be a huge improvement, as over 319 participants have signed up so far. Normally, kids can visit us at the library up to three times a week for a total of 27 visits across the summer. Many kids like to come check in once a week, with some even checking in those full 27 visits. On average, we have about 160 kids check in for summer reading each day. How do we handle those crowds? We rally an army of teen volunteers to greet and engage the kids. These volunteers come back year after year to help out. Our own trustee was one of those summer reading volunteers. We also keep track of the volunteer service in a, a software called Logistics. And you would be really surprised that kids haven't quite ironed out that if they're going to use you as a reference, that they should maybe call you before they put your name on a job application. So we actually will have kids who use us to verify their service hours five, six, seven years down the road. Wow. Nice. All the moving parts for an active summer require materials. I would also like to state for the record that a purchase freeze at my busiest time of year or at any organization's busiest time of year is a hardship. We have a number of outdoor programs on the lineup for summer 2021. I'm not sure when we'll return to in-person program fully. That does depend on the vaccine for our youngest patrons. We'll continue to meet virtually until it's safe for all of us to return to the building. That's my presentation on programming. Do you have any questions? Um, would you, um, yeah, you have, you have a lot of great programs in, for the kids, and I think these are, these are very important. Is there some way to outreach or contact people? Let's say they, they have a, a, a child that's two or three years old, and, and, and kind of tell them exactly. You know, I mean, sometimes people get the uh, chapter one, but they don't pay attention to it. I mean, if you maybe make some, I, I, my first. I mean, so that would be the newsletter. Mm -hmm. what, what I'm thinking is you're running these programs, you could, let's say you got 11 attendees, you, you could run the same program with 18 attendees. So, so in all honesty, the number of attendees rarely uh, reflects the true number of patrons who signed up. As anyone with children know, life happens. I was in the ER uh, with my little one getting his thumb x-rayed. Was that yesterday? These days have kind of blurred. Yeah, yeah. I I had uh, a lot of holiday plans and two days off when I received a request to put this information together. And then an ER visit happens. So I do think that maybe an additional piece of information that you might be interested in is the total number of people who see this, say they want to do it, and then you can compare it to the number of people who show up. But there are a far greater number of people who see it, are engaged enough that they register for the program and aren't able to make it. Life happens. Well, my guess is, let's say we've got 57,000 people in the district. Maybe there's 4,000 that are between the age of one and six or whatever that would be. Another great way to get the word out is to visit the schools and 
our school liaisons do well, just that. I'm, I'm talking preschool, you know, young, youngsters. Okay, so we visit three. preschools and daycares as well. I do have a list of the preschools and daycares that we serve. We serve Aristotle Greek Children's Learning World, Culver Preschool, District 63 First Steps, Embers Preschool, Logos Preschool, Niles Park District Preschool, St. John Brebeuf Preschool. So that's a great way to get the word out. Good question. Um, do you have any more, John? No. 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 I have a question. Um, in regards to your staffing, are you um, interested in actually including two more full-time positions? or? Can I ask Sue to speak into the microphone? It's a little hard to hear you. Sorry, you can pull the microphone a little yeah, pull it, pull it closer to you. Mm -hmm. um, it says here that you're interested in um, full-time staff members. Can you, look, can you tell me what page you're looking it's at? It's on page 256. It's, it's the last line item. Oh, I think she's in your department budget. Your yeah. services department. To accommodate more activity during summer. Oh, uh, so one of the uh, positions that we generally budget for and most often pay for through per capita grants are two summer reading interns. We do like to be good stewards of the professional uh, positions and offer a chance for uh, library students to engage in uh, actual verifiable employment and those are our hourly not hourly paid they're a set number of hours for june july and august so because we're in only virtual summer reading this summer the only thing that was included is next june because that's that sliver of the budget this is this is my big show this is when i spend a large portion of my budget and it's cut in two by this budget year so that's something that we always need to work around it's a big juggling endeavor but we do it that's all the questions that i have thank you trust you Rosanne. yes carry on uh, or hearing in, rather. I get, so, it, all. I get it all. <laughs> yeah. You can call me I'm thinking of the bar right here. Uh, do you said the uh, summer reading, they register online this year? This year, registration is wholly through Beanstack. So what is it called? It's called Beanstack. There's a link on the web page, on the website. It's on the landing page. You can also go to the kids tab at the top and access it that way. Okay. Also, in the department, we have quarter sheet cards with a QR code uh, if you have one of those fancy smartphones. But if you have an Apple or yeah, a QR code reader. Okay, cool. So yeah, it's, whole, it's all online this year. Yeah, because I was looking around because I've been in the children's department. That's one of my favorite places to visit. All right. And uh, I didn't notice anything set up, so I was curious. Thank you very much. You are welcome. Trustee Olson. Um, yes, Ariana, you have a wonderful selection of programming. I wish I had a little one to bring, but I don't. Um, thank you. Thank you. Trustee Keen Adams. Yes, I'm uh, wondering, I was looking through the newsletter and uh, at the programming. So I noticed that you're going to be doing some story times in the parks this summer, I'm assuming because of COVID, right? So you can get out at least and see the kids, which is great. But I'm not sure if those are considered outreach programs because they're out of the library or? That's a great question. Generally, I do consider things when I'm sending stuff out to be outreach. So you could okay. walk quantify it that way uh -huh. yeah. all right and then my other question is you mentioned I, i'm not clear i guess on whether or not you have not been able to get some of your materials for summer reading because of the freeze so traditionally because the budget cuts us into spending um is quite regulated because we want to 
be good stewards of all of our resources. Um, so there was a, 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 a little bit of panic buying. Yeah. Um, I don't think we've got everything though. So I, you know, we'll have to put some alterations out and let them know that the board froze our spending. So yeah, uh, we, we didn't get everything. We tried. So, so the programming, although not intentionally, the intention wasn't to affect programming. It has significantly impacted the kids on reading. That is true. Thank you. I thought of another question. Sure. Due to something that was asked one of the other two days, um, I noticed that in the children's department, there are no chairs out. So the kids cannot use the computer. So the, there was a question about the use of technology. Since this thing with the COVID right now, do you have any anticipation of when that might be available? Because for us to say that technology isn't being used at this point is, I feel unfair. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the target for opening uh, a limited number of computers in youth services is the governor's phase five. And so one of the tricks with that though is that the self check is um, less than three feet away from several of the computers. So we will be opening two computers to the public in youth services. Another kind of uh, tricky part is that uh, a number of the computers are in the middle in the middle ground, and I don't have a good set of eyes on that space. Uh, there are some design flaws in that uh, distribution of children without enough adult eyeballs on them. You're talking about the ones that are geared more for the younger ones? I'm going to get those the on, on the floor. Oh, the ones? The ones on the floor. The, the row of them. The row of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I understand. I'm going to get those going. Because I know the little ones, yeah, they're over by the wall and I could see where that would be a little bit out of eye shot. And a lot of parents, even in the best of times, um, I see the kind of heavy eye roll when their little one recognizes all the iPads and shoots straight for them and engages. And they all are educational apps. However, I can also appreciate that a house might want to regulate screen time. Um, and because the little ones don't have access to a vaccine at this point, the iPads won't be um, available for public use. Makes sense. Thank you. All right, I had a couple of questions. Um, what would what, what is the age group of children for youth services? So youth services officially serves birth through eighth grade. There is uh, a bit of a brackish water between uh, the seventh graders. Those going into seventh and eighth grade can self-select where they feel more comfortable. You have the latent tweens who want to be little forever and are super comfortable staying in youth services through eighth and ninth grade and we're happy to accommodate and serve them. And then you have the um, you know fourth graders who want to be in high school. So, um, <laughs> we do limit access to the teen underground to those with the word teen in their age, so 13 and up. But we also do know that there are some kids whose peer group might have reached the third the, the year, the thirteenth year, yeah. and yeah, if they were right. sent if they moved ahead, as long as they're going into seventh grade, they and are behaving according to behavior expectations, they can be in the space in the teen era. Okay. Um I, I'm concerned about the younger children. Um, apparently there's a bigger issue than I realized. The younger children will not be vaccinated. You didn't realize the impact of that. So that would be any child up to 12 or up to 11? Uh, no, uh, a 12, you, you can get the vaccine if you are 12 and up. Older, okay. So birth through the last day of their 11th year, they are not vaccinated. So that, that's a pretty large group and, and it's a huge I'm, group. I was wondering how is this going to impact your summer programs? I was going through your program pages and I'm trying to just pull out what you have even listed for the summer, like 21 July, 21 June. And I was wondering, um, what, what were you planning they won't be coming in the library? Like your whole little area for little children will just be empty? Correct. All, all summer, like they can engage in summer reading through the Beanstack app and their parents reading with them. Um, and there are 
a number of story times in the park where masking and social distance is required, um, but we didn't do any, we didn't target any little kids to attend those programs, although if a parent is bringing you know, an older sibling, their younger siblings tag along. Yes. But at this point, I feel like that they, I trust that the family is making the best choice for the family. Okay, so in the park, the reading that you have scheduled for the summer, is that for older, the older level of youth? Uh, elementary grades. Oh, okay. If they're in school and they're masked and the government considers them to be safe, we are abiding by those uh, okay. guidelines as well. Well, and, and, and I'm not questioning, you know, your motives. I, I just was surprised to see how many staff are concerned about little children who aren't vaccinated. It just didn't occur to me. But what I wanted to ask you is, um, do you feel that your programs for the younger children are being impacted, like they'll have less this summer because of this? Or are you trying to, I mean, I don't know how much online you can do with little kids. I mean, they don't You do a, a spectacular amount of business with the online trade. It turned out that um, the same way that adult and outreach found that virtual was a fantastic way to uh, connect their patrons with paid performers, speakers, musicians, and the like. Children were not showing up. The, those summer programs that I had booked, um, and I switched to virtual, it, it's like watching a TV show that is not very engaging, and I did not get good attendance for those programs, and so very quickly we realized that we were getting fantastic attendance when Miss April was doing a preschool story time, or when Miss Mikey was uh, doing uh, you know, kind of a chapter a day off of her shelf. So we very quickly switched to uh, primarily, well, wholly, uh, programs put on by staff, and we had a significant um, and faithful audience. Okay, well that's good to know. All right, and then I just had, um, I had a couple of questions. I'm looking at, um, it's in your program summary, 1,000 books before kindergarten, it says year round. Mm -hmm. Is this a daily thing, so, weekly? 1,000 Books Before Kindergarten, it originally was a kind of uh, notebook of sorts where the parents kept track of the number of stories or books that they shared with their children. Okay. If a little one brought you a board book and sat on your lap and insisted that you read it three times over, you could count that book three times because repetition is key to, is a key early literacy skill. The, um, ad, the advent of Beanstack um, having that at our disposal, we saw a number of other libraries, learned about it at a conference, using Beanstack um, for 1,000 books before kindergarten. And we gave it a go. And um, the participation is lower. However, we do reach a broader audience because every single child who, every single registration in Beanstack pulls available programs for that patron. So if a parent registers a little one for summer reading, they're also offered 1,000 books before kindergarten. Great marketing. Great marketing. Great. Yeah. yeah, that's good. Okay. Uh, I'd also like to say that Sarah Muscovich is my bean staff <laughs> wizard. Thank yeah, you, Sarah. Thank you. All right, and then, um, so I'm, now there's something called passive program. I don't even know what age group that is. That that's not a specific age group. It's the, it refers to the way we engage with the program. It's not a staff or talent-led program. It's a program that the patron works through on their own. We set up an experience and the patron comes and moves through it. One great example is that every April we put up a poetry scavenger hunt in the department. There are, um, there's a checklist a set of directions, and the patron takes the checklist in those directions and moves themselves through the space, engaging in the activity that we have set up, and then returns to the table with the completed slip. And that is considered a passive program. Oh, very interesting. Thank you. I was wondering, you know, if it's OK for me to ask this one about the passive program. If I could just ask my last Go question. Go ahead, ask your last question. Um, right, my last question is, um, special story times. It is in person, but they're all to be determined. Is this because of the age group? So, or so um, you can take a look at the information you requested and see that um, what's mapped out for the upcoming year are 437 programs that we've outlined. Um, 439 if you count winter reading and summer reading. 
but uh, in the previous year, we registered or we recorded 602 programs. A lot of the programs that we do um, are inspired by visits or, or uh, the ways that we engage in professional development. And so, you know, just the same way that Mary Kay said, if someone sees something on People Magazine, a book recommendation on People Magazine, and then they come to the library to ask for it, there, there is some new trend or, uh, you know, at one point none of us knew what uh, homemade slime was. And then, all of a sudden, everyone's talking about it, and had I not budgeted for homemade slime, I would not have been able to offer homemade slime. So there are a number of slots that we fill as things come up topically. Okay, so, so this isn't some reading special program. This is everything you do that may come up with because it's popular, is that what this represents? So, so there are um, special summer story, special summer programs. I am more likely to spend money on um, a performer to come in and, you know, I might, I might spend $200 during the school year, but in the summer I might spend $400 because I know I'm gonna get a really solid audience. And so some of those are summer specific programs. It's kind of when we go big, it's our like high season. And then some of them are year round, you know, okay. special programs. All right, that sounds good. Okay, well, that, that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, and this passive thing. Yes. Is that something that's really going on now as much as it did in the past? Uh, yes and no. We're we don't have uh, ways that we generate an interaction because we don't necessarily want to touch the things that the kids have just touched. Mm -hmm. um, so we do have the I Spy tank, yeah, up, for example, and so kids walk over and they engage with that. Mm -hmm. Right now we're not collecting statistics for that. We'll probably add a checklist for that. Because that is usually a checklist you get during the summer. Mm -hmm. And the kids would get like a stamp on their hand. So yeah. I don't know that it's going to make sense that we're touching the stamp on everyone's that. hand. And I was just curious because, you know, like you said, with the kids not being vaccinated and stuff, you have to be a little hesitant on some of that stuff. Yeah. There is a, a QR code. Uh, oh, scavenger hunt. Thank you, sir. There's a QR code scavenger hunt that includes um, our long term summer reading mascot, Glummy, who brought him to. Journey up, and um, that does exist. It's a QR code based um, experience, so a parent would engage with their phone or download. Ah, okay. Yeah, I know. When we were here earlier this week, the kids were into the I Spy. They knew exactly they what it was. Where they went there. Um, yeah. yeah, that's a really fun uh, way to engage. There's a summer reading promotion in the I Spy tank. It's, sometimes it has a theme, sometimes it's just fun. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay. Should we move on to materials? Absolutely. The necessary cuts to the pandemic year 2020-2021 were not catastrophic, but they certainly were felt. We did ask to restore that funding to previous levels of 81,000 for juvenile print and 31,400 for juvenile AV, which includes DVDs, Blu-rays, playways, music CDs, books on CD, speaking books, and launch pads. And that is uh, that AV ask is a reduction from previous years, as Mary Kay uh, also noted, a number of DVDs simply aren't actually being pro uh, physically produced. They're not available for purchase anymore. The periodical budget is shared between teen and uh, juvenile, and that ask is $1,900 between the two of us. Um, according to all of the marks on the budget, uh, it looks like you want to slash the print budget. Um, when that does happen, I must say that we uh, must make selective choices. We will always purchase a book that has a star review and um, things that the Niles patrons are asking for. Um, but we have to be quite selective. Sarah orders, and what she ends up doing is uh, hunting to verify, is it two or three favorable reviews with this budget? Uh, for fiction, three. Okay. 
So it's an extra layer of work. I mean, I guess we're kind of spending her time with that extra hunt, but it, it it's a reduction in budget, so it's fewer books for the children to read. That's all. Do you have any questions? Anyone have any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, the sheet also indicates these adjustments are being made because of low circulation. Is it just because of the past year, right? Yeah, I'm assuming that the um, uh, the call of low circulation is because of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, we made uh, a number of efforts to promote. Um, a curated offering so my staff would um, take a, a phone call or an email or the fan fantastic um, form that marketing enabled called what's next and curate a list for a family we also often would ask you know mom or dad would you like a cookbook are there any travel magazines i can throw in for you trying to satisfy all the household needs um, but sheer door traffic, you know, the, the number of people walking in the building means that less folks are walking out of the building, so that's what the low circulation is, the pandemic. Okay, and of course we expect it to increase them. I think we have to plan for what we hope for. I think so too, because when everything goes back to normal and people do return, I, I don't want my shelves to be sorrowful. I want them to be full of excitement and ways to engage in the community. Thank right, and we do anticipate that children will be able to be vaccinated toward the end of the summer, early fall. So we do expect, you know, a big return when the schools are back in session. I think, you know, that's exactly when she's going to want to have her shelves stocked up and to have, you know, enough books for battle of the books and things like that. Mm -hmm. And that children's print circulation is actually higher than the adult print circulation. Just <laughs> So Ariane, I have a question about um, buying sets of books. I think there was a comment earlier before I got here about how that stuff might be discarded. And um, so could that possibly be from like some award-winning books that the kids, you buy multiple copies of books and the kids can you explain how that works? Sure. I actually raised my hand during Mary Kay's speech, wondering. Oh, if, I missed um, it. I'm sorry. No. Oh, no, 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 no. But I didn't get. I, I didn't interrupt. So I did raise my hand because this exact point that you're bringing up. Um, each year, the Illinois Library Association curates a list of um, books for children, nominated for children's uh, kind of choice awards, a kids choice award, if you ever watched the Nickelodeon kids choice award where the movie stars are handed the uh, yes. trophy and slime balls. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is their version with books and um, in all the local elementary schools, uh, depending on what grade, they are um, they are book chopped, the monarch books for uh, the grades two, three, K to three, K to three thank you, sir. Um, uh, the Blue Stem Awards, which is three, four, and five. The Monarch, I'm sorry, the Coddle Awards, which are four, five, six, seven, and eight. That's a bit of a spread, um, which is why the Blue Stem mm -hmm. came into being. Mm -hmm. um, and those kids get to vote on what their favorite book is. So every year there's like this excited one. Um, and then there's also um, the Battle of the Books that we buy multiple copies for and the um, reading Patch Club that we buy multiple books for. And at the end of the year, we do take um, a certain number of those and we add them to the collection. They're generally gems in the first place. Um, and then there are books that are withdrawn. There are also books that are you know, used in craft programs. Um, and then we do, um, we hope to, we have and we have a new target audience to share some of those withdrawals from in our schools that we serve. Okay. But sometimes it, it, it could be that multiple books of a withdrawn set do end up in their set. We try to find good homes for them. And also, that, that's, again, I'll say this, an industry standard. This isn't something that we're uh, 
making up and doing. This is something that happens in all libraries. Thank you. Um, did you have any other questions? Okay. I did have one. Um, when we were talking about outreach, she mentioned the um, breakdown of what outreach, who out, outreach actually serves. Mm -hmm. And she mentioned school deliveries for curriculum. Could you fill me in on what that actually is? Sure. So a number of the schools in our service area, so um, those tax paying and those tax paying households send their kids to the schools in our service area, and we have a number of ways that we provide service. We have a elementary liaison, we have a high school liaison, and we have a preschool and daycare liaison. Um, and then we also offer teacher cards, and we um, offer teachers the ability to place a request that is uh, content and uh, grade specific, and we pull those books, and we check them out on the teacher card, and bag them, and deliver them to outreach, and outreach um, physically drives them to the school, and then does pick up runs as well. So the books that the teachers are requesting, it says for curriculum, but it's actually individual books for the teachers, maybe to support their curriculum, but it, it's not, they're not books to provide to students to teach a particular curriculum. Sometimes they are, uh, and sometimes they're, uh, you know, scaffolding. So if you have a, an advanced reader, or if you have a slow reader, and the, the text that's generally used needs to be uh, ratcheted up or lowered sure. to that reader's ability and the classroom doesn't necessarily have that or they don't have a good variety they'll reach out to us and we will support those uh, taxpayers in the classroom so um what do we provide um books for the entire class for some sort of reading project or something so that's generally not the case um i just wanted when you talk when we were talking about uh, uh kind of retiring these book lists one of the things that we often do uh, with a large number is to create a circulating classroom set. So we don't buy 36 copies to have for a, you know, we're not the English department for the high school, you know, how they go to the office and they have 60 novels. Right, yeah, I used to order all those books. Um, but if a, if a teacher wants to, tap into those classroom sets. We can send those bags of like five or six books. All of the sets don't make it into the, um, you know, book discussion kit. They're not all exactly what a teacher would necessarily be teaching. They're, they're kids' choice awards, you know, we're, we're trying to get them hooked on reading, so. Okay, all right, that's, that's fine. Thank you so can much. Can I ask one more question? Oh, please do so. Um, on the materials sheet, you indicate that you are seeking an increase from 68000 to eighty one. Could you explain? So that, that's a restoration. Um, the um, the 68850 is what we were knocked down to. We all, you know, saw this pandemic coming and we knocked down our asks for the current budget year oh, okay. and I we, we were knocked down from 81,000 to 68,850 so in this upcoming budget year I asked that funding to be restored okay. um, to the pre-pandemic numbers mm -hmm. and my um, my ask was crossed off I I, I must admit um, that as an informational information professional a lot of what I interpreted is not unlike what the public interpreted all of these Cross, crossing things off and xing them out and I mean to me that says that you're cutting these things so I don't know what else to assume. Uh, you're, you're talking about cutting the you're cut about 15 percent and we have um, because of the kids aren't getting their vaccinations and who knows they, how. They will be before this budget year. But we don't know what rate they're going to come back. Uh, well, so fifteen percent is not a big cut. The twelve-year-olds and up. If if, if yeah. we can be flexible, if there's a problem, we'll we'll, we'll take care of it. That's great news. Thank you. Well, how does that happen? I I guess I, I take that as my budget is restored to eighty-one thousand. <laughs>
Oh, okay. <laughs> Good way to take that guess. Uh, just so you know that most of this stuff you see in red or scratched out was done by two people. Oh, yep. I think I think that is evident by uh, the their names on them. it. Yes. That the rest of us haven't seen it any sooner than any of you have. That's a travesty. I'm so sorry that happened to you. Thank you, but we're sorry for you. Excuse me, you did not receive your documents on Friday. They were hand delivered. What we received no on Friday, I thought we were going to talk about later. Because oh, I you said I could well, talk. Because you brought it up and, and oh, yes. Well, they the got their stuff right before the holiday. Friday was right before the holiday. Well, I am sure Greg did his best to get it out. Well, great. Okay, it's not us. Greg's fault. It's not Greg's fault because it was all hand delivered in a manila envelope by Joseph. Joseph. So, with great the kid, these are what we got from the library in the library envelope, which are basically the agendas. Okay. Thank you. I know this isn't the time to discuss this. It's the time to discuss area. Thank you. Um, all right, so I worked on staffing, uh, my discussion of staffing into a number of different categories um, because we do so many things in this building. Um, I first want to talk about planning and management of programs. Um, Planning and management of programs is augmented by professional development, uh, by meeting in our cohort groups, and uh, assessing the needs of our patrons. That's one of the things that we learn um, in library school is to assess what the needs are. And that's a constant moving uh, value that we uh, are paying attention to. We are listening to, uh, we record every time we say no at the desk. We have a desk trucker and we're recording our interactions and any time you have to say no to a patron whether it's we don't have that book in the catalog or no library in our consortium has that book or we own that book but we don't have a copy to hand you because it's so popular can we put you on the holds list all of the all of the times we say no we even record things like um can i leave my you know four-year-old here unattended and we say no there, there's a policy for that um, but we record all the times and ways we say no because we want to change as many no's to yes as we can and then if there's a procedural element that we need to articulate better in the space we can do that as well uh, another element that my staff does is actually stack the desk we're fielding phone calls I would say Joe that we probably get three phone calls every 30 minutes, how late? Can you use services? Am I, what would you say, Sarah? Yeah. It's about right. The phone is ringing constantly. We also receive requests through email, um, through the form, what's next? The, again, thank you marketing for putting that together for us. Um, and then patrons who walk up. We also manage the space. We're keeping an eye on uh, the safety and access for all patrons. My staff is uh, trained to watch for the little one who's walking around with nobody within arm's reach of them. Um, also to tune in to a little one maybe cowering in the corner and sniffling all by themselves. They've lost track of their grown up. We monitor the study rooms. We help with printing. We help with a good number of computer questions. And again, those computers um, will start uh, availability when we move to phase five. We also answer a number of reference questions. Ours are uh, not quite the same as adult services, but super interesting nonetheless. Our equivalent of the master reference question is the science fair question. Because oftentimes a kid has an amazing science fair question, but they have no idea how to articulate what they need to research or what the testable question is. And uh, those are favorites. Um, we also get a lot of questions um, from parents who have either struggling readers, um, and that's 
take some expertise, or a reader who's very advanced. Um, and so we have uh, regular questions. My child you know, reads it at ninth or 10th grade reading level, and they're in fourth grade. Mm -hmm. Help me find them something to read, and that takes, uh, that's, that's an art. My staff spends their time on collection development. Um, all hands are on deck for collection development. Again, every time we say no, we try to figure out how to get that to a yes. We're listening for what patrons are asking for, what we're saying no to, and what we're struggling to help them find. Similarly, um, we also review on, we, we rely on review journals. Uh, there are a couple that uh, are particular to youth services, uh, Horn Book, Bulletin, School Library Journal, who is actually interested in doing an article on us. Um, where our kind of situation here has risen to the nas national level. Uh, library land is watching what's happening here. They are very uh, dismayed and curious, and they've reached out to us about doing an article about our work. Um, I'm sorry, did you say the school library journal? Or school library journal. We also serve our schools in a number of outreach capacities. I think we've reviewed some of those. We do follow a rhythm of the school year, starting with uh, the weeks leading up to the first day of school. We reach out and speak with the newly hired teachers at the schools in our service areas. We want to make sure they have library cards and are aware of all the library has to offer. We enlist them to be promoters of the libraries to their students. And we are thrilled that the Illinois State Assembly signed the Cards for Kids Act into law this year, guaranteeing the right for those households who are eligible for free or reduced lunches to obtain a library card for their students. We like to say that library cards are the most important back to school item you can have in your backpack. Um, the suggestion or possibility, I'll, I'll leave it as a possibility that the board would uh, end service to daycares, preschools, and schools, and instead ask that they bus their students in for a pre-recorded presentation is simply not feasible uh, for either of those institutions um, or for our hearts. You therefore render those students cut off from our services, and you cut off the teachers, and thereby those tax-paying um, individuals in the classrooms that they serve. We aim to provide support for those teachers by pulling targeted materials to enrich instruction, and we look forward to continuing that. We also engage in outreach with our community partners. You heard a little bit about the fire department breakfast. There are a number of other um, kind of one-day events that we support. We participate in the National Night Out. We support the Village Cycle Series. We help plan and put on the Village Block Party. We're members of powerful partnerships with B219. We, continue, we contribute to an array of programming for the main townships coming together. We support East Main 63's Educational Alliance. Our preschool and daycare liaison serves on the Advocate Lutheran General's Early Literacy Initiative. We partner with the Illinois State Board of Education to provide summer lunches. And we're starting a, a new relationship, well, we've worked with them in the past, but a, a renewed relationship with the Forest Preserve of Cook County. My librarians and staff also manage the space. There are a number of early literacy components that the iPads that uh, Trustee Rosansky was referencing are um, home to a curated collection of educational apps. We manage the early literacy components and manipulatives throughout the space. We have a number of uh, what we call desk games that children can come up and engage with. It's oftentimes the first instance that a child um, walks up and engages with library staff in a public forum. Many times they're very proud they take the card out of their parents' hand and they walk to us and I've heard a lot of, I do it myself, mm -hmm. and they walk up and they um, proudly offer their card up in exchange for uh, early literacy manip manipulative um, and then return it to us so there's some accountability and there's an exchange and the child has a very successful interaction. We also 
um, as you as we discussed previously, um, engage our patrons in a number of uh, passive programming opportunities, and there's also the you know clean up in aisle 11. We're helping with um, leaky diapers, and uh, I've I've personally held pressure on a gaping wound for which a uh, uh, emergency vehicle was called and the kid had stitches. I was the one that applied pressure. Mom was seriously struggling and I picked that baby up and hold them tight. Uh, so I am a little short of hours right now and it's it's kind of good news, bad news. I did have some part-time hours that I was able to cobble together and bring in um, a fantastic library associate who speaks Spanish. Um, but those two part-time positions were my primary weekend coverage. And then I have one unfilled uh, part-time librarian that was also crossed off. So I kind of thought that that meant I pretty much fill that position. But um, weekends are a very busy time. Um, to be honest, I'm struggling right now just with Saturdays. And when we go back to full-time and plug Sundays in, I'm really going to need that um, support. Yeah, Sundays are crazy here. Sundays are off the hook. They're, it's such a, it's it's a wildly energetic and amazing display of the way that your community engages in this building. They they are standing outside, lined up, you know, in pre-pandemic times. They rush in, you can hear the sound move through the building, and they are very happy to be in the space. That is all I have for staff. Okay, um, any questions, anyone? Yeah, um, what percentage of the, what is the age that uh, on a company, uh, they, they have to be uh, 12 or under, they have, if they're under 12, you need an adult with them, don't you? You, have, you don't have four-year-olds coming in alone here. No, we don't have four-year-olds. I mean, what, what age is it that... Uh, uh, so, there was... Uh, I think the, did the policy book say 12 years old? I think? No, it says eight. Um, and there there was a large discussion um, with mm -hmm. the previous board. Uh, the trustees who were part of that can attest to the in-depth conversation. We um, reached out to a number of our educational and on community partners to see when they kind of allowed a kid to be on their own. Um, we did not go as young as five, which is the age that some of the school districts will let a little one walk home alone. Wow. Um, we're, we're, we're at eight. So eight and over can be in the library unaccompanied as long as they feel comfortable, they know how to get a hold of their grown up, and they abide by our behavior expectations. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's about 90% of the time it works. And then uh, when it doesn't work, we step in and reach out to grownups and let the kid know that they're very welcome and we are super happy to have them, but we do have an expectation. Uh, for example, people go shopping and they drop their kids off at the library and come back three hours later. Do you have that situation going on? Uh, I, I I wouldn't say that that happens. Never. I'm never gonna say never. <laughs> uh, however, if the child was younger than eight and we recognized that they were um, without a parent, then we do call home or the police. If we can't reach somebody, we do call the police. But I I, I think when I bring my grandchildren here to get books and stuff, I, I observe that most of the little kids, I mean, maybe under the age of 10, even 12, somebody's got to drive them here, and there's an adult there with them. A lot of them are here on foot or on bike. Um, Those would be a little All the older older kids, yeah. they have a crossing guard that helped them across the street. Yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of them make... A lot of them are from Culver, too, I think. Oh, mm -hmm. at 3 o'clock. That's right. You hear all the... You hear and the they're football till, around the building. So their parents pick them up at 5. <laughs> Well, how lucky place than on the street. So. Yeah, how, how lucky uh, yeah. we are to yeah. have a place where our kids are Sorry. engaged and safe. That's I, I, I think, I, not I think, I have had library.
library patrons who are Niles cardholders come up and say, I moved to this library, I moved to this city because of this library. It's a great place. I would we'll say the kids at Culver might have a higher reading score than some of the other schools in the district, in the area here. You might say that, yeah. I'm not going to say that. Sometimes parents come with the kids too and like, my son is finally old enough that I can bring him here and let him go choose a book while I go upstairs and choose a book. So you might see kids unattended, but it doesn't always mean that their parents are not in the building. It, it, it is also a very safe place to take those first steps mm -hmm. to allow a child to have a measured, safe uh, individual experience where you know no one's that child will not come home. Yeah. Because librarians are paying attention. Yeah. Well, in, in mine, when I bring them, they know enough to go ask the librarian if they have a question. And hopefully, parents are teaching them. If you have questions or concerns, they're there to help you. What a wonderful civic lesson you're sharing with your friends. That's great. But I think that's actually a good point, Joe. Sometimes kids do come to the library right after school and say, you know, if a parent is working and they can't come get them, then maybe they have to spend an hour here after school. But they can be getting study help. Um, they can be doing research for projects, there's all kinds of different kinds of ways that you can use that time. We do actually uh, increase coverage on the desk at 3 o'clock because our after school crowds are coming in, so it also requires additional staffing at the desk, but that's great. I think it's fantastic that kids are attracted to this place. I think it means we're doing a good job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Trustee Shumpel, did you have any questions? On the underground desk that we have in the library, what time is it open to? Um, so that's in my team presentation. Would you like me to jump ahead or would you want me to answer that right now? Um, whatever. You, you can wait then. Okay. <laughs> I hope to answer all your questions. Oh, I Trustee Rosansky. Just one question. What's your time? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. The Wonderground, is that the one on the main level, or, yeah, that's the one I have a question for. Sure. Because that's related to this age. Um, I know they've been doing a lot of their stuff on Zoom. Do you have any idea when you're going to start doing that in person? So, um, there is discussion with social committee about bringing the children who are eligible for a vaccine, um, scheduling in-person programming starting in the fall. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ariana. Um, your community participation is just very impressive. Besides everything else that you do in the library, thank you. I, I must say, I, I, my entire staff loves this building, loves this community, loves being a service here. Thank you. Any other I just a thought popped into my head when you're talking about vaccines and the kids. Um, is there any partnership that we could possibly do when that comes around for kids to have them vaccinated? I love it. I'll ask Cindy. Well, we'll look into that. <laughs> okay. Talking about I, professional development. Well, no, I have a question. Okay. Um, you mentioned community partners, and then you were talking about ISBD lunches. What is that? So the Illinois uh, State Board of Education right. sponsors um, free lunches to children in the state, and they are the fiscal sponsors of the lunches. Um, we have a service provider for summer lunches. It's the diocesan food service professional. Food service professionals. Um, is this the summer lunch program? Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, we had said no to it last summer because there's, there's no way that we could have kids eating in the building. This summer they've agreed that we can participate in a grab and go format. So we won't be setting up the tables. The children, the food will not be consumed on library property. Well, I can't say that they might not sit on the lawn and enjoy a picnic. Um, but the food will be distributed in the um, entry and it will be taken out of the building. Okay. Susan, was this 
Um, I know when you and I spoke, you mentioned the Archdiocese of Chicago. Is this the that, 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 that is there? sorry. That is the, that's the Archdiocese company. Okay, I just wanted to know if they were connected. Okay, that that was my one concern. And then, um, so now that's clear. Um, what I wanted to ask you was, would you be able to provide me with a, um, a list of your schools? You mentioned that for outreach, you know, you go to elementary schools or preschools. Could, could I ask to get that information from you? Sure. Would you like me to speak it into the record or send it to you? No, I, could, you I would like my own copy so I can review it over the weekend with everything else. Sure, I can send that to you all in a email. Okay, great. That would be wonderful. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you very much. That's all I have, and thank you so much. For I can make one more question. I'm sorry, I came in my head after I sure. was done. Um, you were mentioning how many people come in on a Sunday. How, you know, it was marked on the papers that we reduce the hours or maybe don't go back to having Sundays. How do you think that will go over in kids' days? That's going to be a, a huge loss. There are families that work non-traditional hours and their weekends may actually have uh, work assignments. So to be available to have open hours on Saturday and Sunday is very important to the community that you serve. Thank you. I'm going to suggest we go kind of fast through the next couple of things because we've been covered so thoroughly by the other departments and it's sure. 10 o'clock and we haven't started team yet. Um, but if you have something important to say, by all means. No, I, I did, um, I will just read this one paragraph. My staff engages in a wide array of professional development. They participate in cohort groups, serve on committees which produce deliverables on the state level. They participate in selection committees which render the state book award lists. They're on planning committees which organize and run conferences. They are community members who serve the Township ELL Center, and they contribute to the ELI Committee Through Rails. I, I, I feel like it's an abomination for a professional organization not to contribute to the professional body, because there is so much that we take from it that if we, if we step back from our contributions to it, we are a net drag on the system. That is all. Thank you. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Oh, we want to move on to team. Yes, if you're finished with that. Okay. as restrictions are limited. We are comforted in knowing that team vac vaccinations are widely available. I do want to take a moment to address the board's indication that they feel that the teen underground should be closed at 8 p.m. The Village of Niles has a 10.30 p.m. curfew. It is not at all reasonable to restrict access to public services. Article 5 of the American Library Association Bill of Rights states, a person's right to use the library should not be denied or abridged because of origin, age, background, or views. This specific line that was scrawled on my budget is discriminatory against teenagers. Thank you for bringing that up. I had that on the paper as well. Thank you. You are proposing to directly contradict the rights of our patrons and this will probably be included in the school library journal. We'll start with programs. Although we couldn't provide, oh, well, I should start with what you have in front of you. 
the amazing um, volume of work that was requested of us uh, was not completely finished. Um, the worksheets, as they were created in Word, were unworkable for collecting large amounts of data and manipulating it. So when I started running out of time, I leaned into this amazing forum, thank you Sarah Muscovich, um, to put all the pieces of information that are necessary to fill in the multiple forms that you've requested we fill out. Um, and I'm happy to do that work in the coming days. Um, but instead of having nothing to talk about for teen, I gave you all the pieces. They're just not in the same format that you had us fill the others in. Sarah Ann, can I interrupt you? That's yes. Fine. Um, those requests and those forms that the employees got, I think that the tr all the trustees should have copies of those. I don't know if that would come from. Oh, I, I think that would be great for you all to see. Yes. I, they, were, they were very confusing. Two of them were the same form with a different title. Um, they requested one style of information on one form and then did not include that style of information in another form. It was very confusing. Susan, I think I cried maybe five times okay. in this process. I'm sorry. Sorry to share some with you. This has been very trying. Okay, programs. Although we couldn't provide a physical space for teens to gather in, our virtual programs have filled in and created that space online. We've been able to nurture relationships with our teens and parents virtually over the past year so that when they are able to come in, that connection and trust is there. Once we have teens gathering in the space again, we will continue to host these programs as they are most engaging and have intrinsic value. They teach skills like cooking, provide an outlet for creative expression, promote literacy, they promote reading, they build social emotional skills and facilitate trusting relationships. Those same kids who grew up volunteering in kids space turn into teens and they too have a need for volunteer opportunities. Kudos to our teen staff for pivoting to come up with a number of creative and engaging ways for our teens to volunteer. Service project programming and writing and putting on playbills are other ways that we also incorporate volunteering into programming. I gave a breakdown of youth hours and their volunteer contributions and I'll do so for teens. In 2018, teens contributed 455 hours to the library. In 2019, they contributed and we provided more than 326 hours uh, in service of the library. And in 2020, despite the pandemic, they were able to contribute 414 hours of volunteer service to their community. Teens are also excited to find their first jobs and their first paychecks. Our staff puts on a teen job fair that gathers area businesses and connects them with those opportunities. Last year, they shifted to a virtual fair, but hope to be back in person for the next version. They did, however, maintain a link tree list through Instagram, which is where all the cool kids hang out, and they compiled a list of job opportunities that were available for um, our community members. When the most heartbreaking tragedy struck our community last year, the death of a local patron, teens rushed to the teen underground upon hearing this news. Our staff was able to comfort and console them. The village social services reached out to us and coordinated with our staff directly to provide immediate counseling. Samar was a constant fi fixture in the teen underground, and before that, he was a summer reading volunteer. We hosted a memorial event for him, unveiling the sign that still hangs in that window and the memory tree that went up just before we were all shut down. I'm kind of tired. Sorry. The Teen Advisory Board has planted a number of seedlings and new plants in the window well that opens onto that space. That sense of community doesn't happen by chance. Oh. I think that memorial tr could contribute to um, you stuff was incredible. And I think he goes by sound. And you saved a lot of children by being there for them as well. Yeah. The joyous part of our service to teens is seeing them launched into the next phases of their journeys. 
One element of team programming, pre programming includes college prep opportunities. We marshal representatives from the state through ISAC to come in and discuss college savings with students and parents. Thank you. We arrange for trial ACT SAT test opportunities and review those results. We put on college essay and writing programs. We've even had parents come in to ask for help. Oh, you guys are so sweet. To help with uh, the tuition assistance forms that are required. Celebrating all things entertainment is, I'm sorry, I'm switching gears real fast here. I'm fast. Celebrating all things entertainment is a mainstay of the teen experience. We have a number of programs that dig into anime and celebrate all things fandom. <laughs> Free Comic Book Day, which is a national event, is also a fun way for teens to publicly proclaim their love of reading. I'm going to take a breath and let you ask some questions. Okay, do we have any questions regarding food services? Can I start with you, Trustee Mokula? No. No? Trustee Schoenfeld? Mm -hmm. Trustee Rosansky? Um, I, what I have observed, I'm very, very satisfied, and I think it's a great uh, program. Thank you. Thank you for everything. It's just overwhelming sometimes. Thank you. Um, I noticed there was a mark about um, the Teen Underground only being open during non-school hours. Is that not the case already? So the Teen Underground is actually a repository for the public collection, so blocking it is not something we would ever do because that would be limiting the collection. There are families that come in and um, teens are not the only ones that like video games and pop culture and music and magazines and good reads. So that 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 that's just not possible. Um, and then we don't staff the desk during that time. But the room is open. It will be open. There's also homeschool kids. Those are taxpayers too who have the right to access this materials. We purchase those materials with their tax dollars. They have the right to access them. When do you this is uh, actually a question for my son and his friends. When do you foresee having multiple computer stations open in the team lounge? So the same way that we're going to um, open them in uh, youth services okay. for phase five, we're going to. Um, I think we do have one open right now, don't we? Two. two. We do have two open right now. Um, there, one was. I, I mean, we're not really encouraging them to hunker down and be in yeah. her hours on end, but um, kid, gaming is a, is access of information as well. Kids have a right to game. My garage has turned into the team house. <laughs> God bless you. Thank you. Uh, okay. You have some questions? Just one. Did you say um, that you don't stamp the desk in um, the underground, but there are homeschool kids who come through and parents? So there is a camera in the space, but there's also a public service desk um, within iShot. So every single oh. individual who enters the lower level passes by the digital mm -hmm. services so desk. So there's somebody there. And I want to give a shout out to digital services staff who really does pitch in in incredible and meaningful ways to help support these teens. Um, they're not always the most genteel, calm, <laughs> quiet, or fresh smelling. and. <laughs> <laughs> really, digital services, they didn't sign on to be team librarians, but they pitch in and help us out. So, shout out to us, digital services. Well, thank you for that. Another reason they have them as the best. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If, if there's more than one, we're headed down. And uh, it probably would be a good time to mention that, you know, it's not, they, these are not separate departments. They're, the team librarians are part of youth services, and so a variety of people might be sitting on that desk. And so, yeah, it's, it's not just the team librarians. They, they primarily work with the teams, but um, it's, a, it's a full array of people that might be down there. Yeah, we'll, we'll uh, review that in staffing because it's not just team librarians who are managing my desk. Do you have any further questions? No, I don't know. Great, let's move to materials. Um, again, the necessary cuts. 
in the pandemic year of 2020, 2021 were felt, uh, but not catastrophic. We do ask to restore funding to the previous levels of $15,550 for teen print and $8,500 for teen AV. And again, periodicals are included in these numbers. Anyone have any questions or comments? Sure. Doing great, by the way. Thank you. All right, staffing. So again, there's a number of different things that um, is encompassed in staffing. The planning and management of programs um, and the staffing of desks. At the desk, they field phone calls, they receive emails, they manage um, all the questions for patrons and parents uh, included walk up. They uh, practice space management, uh, safety and access again are the main aims. They also help out with printing and computer questions. Um, I have been very lucky and uh, had the ability to provide consistent staffing in the evening hours uh, over the past few years. This has allowed for an uptick in teen attendance. This is a super rare phenomenon in YA library land, and we are thrilled. So to tell any teen that they have to go home at 8 p.m. is, uh, is going to fly in the face of the successes that we've had getting a, a teen uh, community built up in that space. My two full-time staff members don't provide sit and wait. Um, service. They are often floating around the room, engaging with teens in uh, their passive activities, engaging in conversations. Community building and social and emotional support is very hard to measure, but we know that, that these teens uh, recognize and appreciate our presence and availability. Our teen librarians are also uh, managing the collection. We're again marking down every time we say no, what we're struggling to find for them. There might be a new uh, anime or manga that we um, hear from them and we get to work tracking it down. But again, the primary source would be the review journals. Um, that's a huge help as we can't read every single uh, thing out there, although we do cover quite a bit of territory. We also provide outreach for the schools. Our high school liaison provides book talks on the Lincoln list and the caudal list. They take part in career day. They share the volunteer opportunities uh, as a program to, with the teens. They visit after school clubs and promote library services. They serve as judges for the FCCLA storytelling. They promote break for books, which is kind of a kickoff to summer reading. And they set uh, up a table at the volunteer fairs at Niles West and Main East. We also engage in a number of outreach opportunities with our community partners. Um, we are partners with the teen center at the Gulf Mill Mall. Uh, one of our teen librarians serves on the Coming Together Committee and both teen librarians uh, this past summer served on the Niles Teen Task Force and that was a village partnership uh, with Niles. They're also managing the space. However, this amazing space uh, created in 2013 uh, does have need of some soundproofing. I, I, I want to be a good neighbor to our digital services uh, uh, roommates in the lower level. And sometimes the occasional rise in noise level um, is annoying to those digital services patrons. There's a, a pane of glass, and I don't know if you noticed, there's like a ribbony or a rainbow shimmer bathroom window blocker, so to speak. Um, it, it, it's a little difficult sometimes. Teens are one type of person, and um, if they don't mix well with some of our patrons who want to come in and get to work in the computer. So I would really appreciate some sound buffering. The patrons would appreciate that. I have a question. Do you have any idea when you're talking about some soundproofing? What there are work? there are some um, and what would it cost? Any idea? So there's a, some serious limitations due to the design of the space. Yeah. Uh, the light well in the teen underground uh, provides ambient sunshine for the entire lower level. 
So blocking your windows robs them of that daylight. Also glass conducts electricity, right? That's what those little transformers on the light pulse are. So sound goes through that glass and that it's tricky business. I think, you know, Susan, Ms. Susan kind of laughs every time I share my vision. But I think, this is worth saying now, my vision is, as youth and teen services supervisor is to one day in the next renovation take over the entire first floor and lower level. The teens can hang out in the lower level. Um, we will build digital services, an amazing new computer lab and amazing, uh, we will outfit them and kids can be on the first floor right the teens. That's my dream. So there's also sound transmission that goes from the lower level up uh, to the uh, second floor, mm -hmm. uh, and it's you know it's just a problem all the way around. Um, the uh, uh, the wood ceiling uh, conducts sound very easily. Uh, it's very efficient. So there's a ceiling uh, with wood beams and and so forth that you know that is exposed to the uh, teen underground and the floor directly above it, uh, which is the uh, second floor uh, adult fiction area, um, toward the open side gets a lot of that vibration. So we've, we've experimented with um, you know, different, uh, you know, different types of foam apparatus and stuff, trying to find an easy to install solution. It's a little bit tricky because the uh, uh, if you put too much up there, then you're talking about rerouting electricity, rerouting mm -hmm. the sprinklers, and, mm -hmm. and all of that sort of thing. So, you know, uh, we just haven't found uh, an economical solution, and at some point uh, we probably need to bring in uh, somebody to uh, help us understand what a better solution is. In terms of the digital uh, sound trans uh, transference between digital services and, uh, and the teen underground, not only is that glass a great conductor of sound, but there are uh, there are gaps which also help the sound uh, to move unimpeded. Um, you know, so you know it's uh, it, you know they did the best they could during the renovation with what they had to work with. Uh, not exactly counting on the sound transference or or how much that would uh, interfere with somebody trying to do quiet work on a computer. That's true. Do you have any questions about staffing? I do not. Anyone have any questions? Okay. I I do have some things to say about professional development and membership and subscriptions. We generally do send one staff member to the Young Adult Library Service Association conference. This year it is virtual, so that is a savings of transportation and housing, which are not in play. This is a very important gathering of the teen librarians. They are a very unique tribe. They, uh, oh, no, that's not the right They're a very unique uh, cohort of professionals. They discuss, strategize, and learn about current practices and ways to maintain our great patron engagement. One of my teen librarians is on the IRE committee at the state level and uh, does attend that conference. Her service means that she can attend for free, um, but it's kind of professionally embarrassing not to have a presence at these conferences. Our professional memberships allow us to take part in a larger conversation about the service that we provide. Staff who serve on committees and throw in a work shift for a period of time then reap the reward of that work when they are not on the committee. Our summer reading theme, graphics, and programming ideas are generated through this committee work, and when no one steps up to serve on these committees, that work falls on the individual libraries. Reinventing the wheel year after year is expensive, and sponsoring staff to take part in a group in group work means that the work is done by a few and will be shared by all. And I did want to share um, the publication that is sent to the individual with their professional memberships. There are a lot of great articles. This is a fantastic uh, trend article about old school outreach and the ways that we can engage our patrons on so many different levels. That's all I have for professional development and membership subscriptions. Um, does anyone have any questions? I, I do have one. 
Do you want to go, Trustee? Yeah. Sure. I'm just curious, um, and I think you may have answered it already, but I'm looking at the memberships, and I'm only seeing Donna on here and not Rachel. Is that because she was already? No, Rachel um, is a you know she's she throws her professional endeavors into um, a lot of local undertakings. She did not put in for those professional memberships. But would she like to? I think she'd like to. Thank you. It, it is a matter of also, uh, it's Donna's year to go to Yelsa, so if it was a, a Rachel year, she does throw in for it because you pay that as an additional fee were you not a member in the first place. So on years that Rachel goes, she does throw in for it. Good question. I have just one question. Professional membership, is that the column called fees? Under memberships and subscriptions, when you refer to professional memberships, you're, you're talking about fees, is that the same terminology? Um, I, you could call it a fee, it's like the, yeah, a membership fee. Okay. Cause so that's your professional member, but that's we're talking about the same thing then. Okay, got it. I did I, I I bundled professional development and membership subscriptions for the name of the Well that's fine, but the term professional membership represents professional development oh, is, is okay. one thing. I apologize, I did combine them and no, I, no, you were right. I had it on the right page, but then all of a sudden I saw fees and thought maybe I was wrong. No, no, you your, your statement was correct, but I understand. Thank, Thank you. you. I think you've covered everything, correct? Am I posting anything? The fund five is the last category. Did you have anything else, Ariane? probably have the most dynamic departments in the entire library, although I do value the others as well. Yeah, we probably haven't said quite enough of what phenomenal staff members we have in adult and teen, adult and outreach and youth and teen. They're just incredibly passionate, committed, knowledgeable, hardworking. We're very fortunate to have those people on staff. Definitely. And great leadership, as you saw tonight. Thank you. Okay, thank you again. So, are there any, I believe there's a lot of final comments that we wanted to get through. Can I just ask one quick question? Are there copies of all the um, department um, documents here for Olivia? Yes. Okay, thank you. I'll pick them up only late for her. All right, um, did anyone have any other comments? Uh, I just that asked if, about this, and there's a, there are questions, yes. This is the note that Joe put in our, in between my doors, along with a packet of stuff that he crossed everything out of that we had no knowledge until we saw it on Friday. The 2021-2022 budget is based on 54 hours of operation weekly. The director will adjust daily operation hours to reflect the 54 hours of highest patron uses per week. The director shall provide the board with the daily numbers of original borrowing by category. Um, the board, Joe and Carolyn are not the board, they're just two members of the board. Thank you. Oh, and the other question is um, pertaining to the budget <coughs> meeting. I feel it's extremely important, and I also 
consider whether there's legalities about having a budget meeting without all board members present. Thank you. Anyone else have any comments? Um, Trustee Olson, I don't know if you have spoken about well, whatever it was you wanted to say. I, I thought that um, Greg was going to present some possibilities for the budget meetings today. Or is, is that not true, Greg? Uh, we left the, this room last night. Oh, yes, we can certainly have that conversation. Well, I forwarded the. Um, an email from Carolyn saying that uh, because Olivia cannot change her schedule that it is going to remain on the 14th and 16th and I did check with our attorney and that is that is enough time between those two meetings so uh, they are back they're staying where they are there again we have a board member who can't be here on the 14th and I want to know the legalities of having a budget meeting without a board member well, I believe I clarified that issue at the last meeting because of all the yelling and unruliness. I never even heard her comment, so I tried to accommodate Trustee King Adams last night. But of course, the one trustee that wasn't here, I needed to contact. We all knew that, so we couldn't move forward. But more importantly, not just because this particular trustee couldn't switch her schedule, we were falling into August, the 30 days from the tentative to the final approval, there, it just wasn't working. And we didn't want to extend this budget process any longer. I mean, August was becoming very problematic for many reasons. So unfortunately, that's why we're back on this schedule. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what reasons? For which reasons? That we're not going to... Use August as our the final date. In order to have the meetings and to have 30 days between the tentative budget and the adoption, we couldn't fit it in. We were already at the end of August. I'm not I'm not inclined to begin a budget year without our budget in place. Um, we spent a great deal of time listening to all of these departments, waited an entire month before we review this information and come up with a tentative budget would be a waste of all this information we sat through. Um, yeah, since it was the original date that was set, I mean, I, I didn't realize... Again, the dates were set without asking any of the three of us, and one of us happens to work evenings if we would be available for the five days you told us we had to be here. Okay, what you need to understand is our budget year begins July 1st. Oh, I understand. I also know we can have until September to do it. You know, it doesn't matter how long you're allowed to drag your budget out. What's important is that you have a budget to begin your fiscal year. What's important is that all of the board members are here. Okay, the Thank one, you. The one day that Trustee Keen Adams is unable to attend is a discussion. Uh, yeah, which is usually when the board members need to be here, especially with all of the red I saw in the stuff that Joe gave us. Well, I, I'm, I'm trying to understand the impact that oh, please. we'll be losing. Basically, on Wednesday, which is our general meeting, you're going to just do the basic stuff. You're going to, majority of the discussion is going to be on the day when Becky can't be here. So I, I do have some questions and comments on this topic. Um, I think it would have been very helpful for everyone to know the meeting dates before they were given to us because we didn't have any input on it. It was not like hey, are you guys available on this date, this date, this date. It was just like here's the dates. Take it or leave it. Exactly. Um, so that was very exclusive and not fair. Um, now that we've had these meetings, I know that when when we had to talk or when I tried to make it known that I would not be able to attend a lot of these meetings, I don't. And I think I did 
specifically ask if there were any other board members that would not be able to make the meetings. Just waiting for you. Um, I was asked, I asked all the board members. I can hear you, please continue. If they were available to attend, and everyone besides me said yes, they were able to attend. Um, however, that is obviously not the case. So it's, it's very not transparent to have these meetings thrust upon us. And then uh, when making efforts to come every day in a row like I have, even though I had to work and come afterwards, uh, I think that's a pretty big effort that should be taken into account. And it is a shame that, you know, one of us has to work that day and one of us doesn't have, I mean, it just, we have to take into consideration everyone's schedules and not schedule meetings without asking each other and assume that it's going to happen. I, and then I don't believe like also, um, you know, so scheduling good. three in a week like that is, and then ramming it all into one week. And as we all said last night, we don't have enough time to digest the material to be able to meet again next week and talk about it because it was so much information jammed into one week that we didn't have any input on. Um, as far as going into August, I think we talked about that last night and it is a possibility. I don't know if that's a decision that one person can make or if that's a decision the board has to make as a whole. But yes, I'm very concerned about the legalities of this. If we are going to go forward and do what was said on the first night that everyone was sworn in, how much we all love this library and how much we all want to work together, we need to really put that into action by speaking with each other about what our ideas are, Joel, and not just giving people papers with things crossed out because it does give the appearance. I mean, it was a real shame to see every staff member that came up here scared and nervous and fighting. It was like they're fighting for their jobs. And it's a really bad situation to put them in. And I feel horrible for all of them. And maybe that wasn't your intention, but that is how, you know, unless given other input that contradicts that, it, it, they're kind of put between a rock and a hard place of how to interpret that. And I think it was very apparent when they came to the chair, I mean, Athena looked like she was shaking like a leaf. It, it's really, a sad state of affairs. We need to communicate with each other. We need to work together. We need to plan together. And I would really ask for all of us to do that in the future. And I even, the setup that we have here is divisive. I mean, I can't even see Susan. And I, we should be speaking to each other and with each other, not looking away from each other. That's unfortunate, but this is a board setup. I, I realize you would probably rather be in a more community environment but this is a setup. Well it's more conducive to being a cohesive group to be able to see each other. Is it possible that on that Monday you can uh, be on phone, on a phone with us or Zoom or something like that? I don't know if that is allowed by the All Open Meetings Act. It's not a reason to remote in. Vacation is not a reason to remote in. I can, I can double check that but I believe that is not covered in the OMA. Could you please also cover the legalities of not having a board member here? Can I um, just respond to your comments? Um, I agree that um, we're all supposed to work together and um, the documents that were dropped off with Joe's comments obviously um, weren't well received, but I will admit we could have come together better. I feel Excuse me, I'm Go ahead, talk, speaking. talk. When you're done, please let me know. God forbid I should interrupt you. We could have come together, together better than we did. Um, what upset me more than anything was the intentional fear that was created by the false statements that were made from the first day we met I feel very the, gaslighted right now. I'm just going to say the, that right now. The, um, I yeah, feel gaslighted. I don't, what, I don't know what you're saying. I, I don't understand the false statements you're talking about. Okay, the honest. first day when we started meeting, when the first workshop 
we started off the meeting with, we're eliminating outreach, we're eliminating this, and that wasn't true. We didn't even get a chance. Look where all the zeros marked on your outreach. You know, see, this is what I mean. I'm, I just want to know why did you get zeros on all the outreach? I have nothing more to say. Good. Because I'll be honest with you. These past two weeks, since you and Joe decided to write all of this stuff up and shove everything in our doors and everything, I feel like you're trying to intimidate us. And I got news for you. You being another Southside girl should know that it doesn't work with Southside girls. And, and again, I'd like to remind everyone, the, the schedule of meetings was to have us prepared to start our budget year on time. We didn't start in April like we normally do. We had to wait for the election to be over, so we started in May. This wasn't intentional to, to exclude anyone. I was trying to fit it in so that we could, and I don't know if you all have the legal calendars from Klein, Thorpe, and Jenkins that tells you exactly what, what ordinances need to be passed by what date. That's what I was using. Okay. But and when, today, Susan confirmed that to, to make sure that even doing it the first way we planned it would fit within the timeline that's required. So I apologize. I know it's horrible, but it, it's just the way it went down. But there's, there's no intent here to exclude anyone. Obviously, this didn't go well, but I still think we can have open dialogue without attacking each other. I mean, we just had two staff people walk out. Carolyn, to be truthful and honest here, it's okay to attack when it's you in the previous board. All you would do is sit there and yell at us for 20, 30 minutes straight. Here, I put up a few concerns over the fact that I feel you're trying to railroad this situation through and not be considerate of a board member who cannot be here. Thank you. I move that we adjourn this meeting at this point. We, we still need to decide how we're going to handle this. The president already decided there's a okay, meeting on fine. the 14th. When I contact the lawyer, we'll see. Get a lawyer. I'll, I'll contact somebody and find out okay, how legal fine. this actually is. Okay. So, excuse is me, are we promoting this budget process or not? What are we trying to do here? Today? I would like to be able to have the budget process, but realistically, we need to have every board member here. If they're going on vacation, that's per, their prerogative. Oh, come on. That's, but, that's uh, you know, Olivia is, is working. She's when she on. had worked two days of this three-day session, Did any was there any consolation for her? No. She has this plan for how long, and now, because you couldn't consult with the rest of us, she's no longer included? Excuse me, Trustee Rosansky, um... If you recall, this budget process takes place the same, pretty much the same time every year. This isn't new. If you recall, we are usually asked if we have any issues with the days or given days and we have a choice and we have some discussion of it, which we had none. It was all appointed and decided by you. And usually we don't have five days that we are expected to be here for the budget. In case you don't realize, you know, some of us have lives outside of the library board. Trustee Rosansky, again, we did not start the budget process in April, which would have been ideal. We had an election this year. And this is the first year in the eight years I've been on this board that we had the opportunity to listen to our department heads to find out what goes on in their departments and what they're concerned with, I think that was valuable. I'm sorry. I'm not saying it wasn't valuable. I'm just saying the fact that you want to have a budget meeting without a member of the board is ridiculous. You know what the village is? Oh, you know what, Just Joe, like this. You and are people just are missing here sometimes. For two weeks and you're coming on like yeah. you're the God blessed king of the yeah. library. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm done. I move that we adjourn this meeting. Fine. At this point. Let's oh, wait. Go. I'd like to just make one statement. Trustee Keen Adams, since you'll be on vacation, is there any information that you would like to? I mean, you're aware of what we're. I don't know when you're leaving for vacation, though, but are you here next week? Or? I'm here next week. I guess what I'm trying to suggest is 
you've seen the presentation. I mean, you have a position. You've seen these lined out sheets. I mean, if there's, if you have comments, I mean, we'll read them. We'll we'll consider them. I mean, if that would help. I mean, I know this is um, this is a situation. I don't know how to remedy. To tell you the truth, trying to get this budget passed. But so are we going to be are we going to be deciding on the, the same packet as far as um, all of your deletions? Is that what we're going to be voted on? The information that you were given were the recommendations, and so we're going to decide who and we're going to we're going to decide on those recommendations. Well, you're going to provide input and, and maybe alternatives. Okay. I mean that was that was my idea of a discussion. We heard from the departments; they brought up recommendations, or they explained their positions. So we only have one chance to go through this. Well, that's all you ever had, actually. You just had. But we never had, had. We never had a budget presented to us with so much um, negativity and deletions. And well, let's come up with alternatives. To Are you going to listen to the possibility of going into August? What happened to that? I mean, was that a Carolyn decision that, but it. is that a board decision or is that a one person decision? I don't remember voting on it. I don't know if that's we didn't. a possibility. Well, we can't take a vote tonight, that's for sure. No, no. and realistically, this Why is a heck of a way to try and start us not? without even asking us. Uh, Why is that not um, able to happen tonight? Because there's no voting this treaty. You made that very clear. Remember you asked when you weren't going to be able to make it? We said no, we wouldn't Yes, vote. I do remember. Mm -hmm. Actually, I had another item, and um, Susan brought it to my attention, that we can't vote. So. But um, I, I don't know. I don't know what else to recommend. Um, well, I would recommend, please, asking in the future for our input when meetings are being planned. Well, I don't expect to have a budget a month later to prepare for a budget a month later than than we should have. So that's for sure. Um, and, um, and and that and I guess I I can't say it enough times because we started in May as a at the end of some election. This happens every two years. I mean, what it does come down to is that in a normal budget year, the board basically accepts the recommendations of staff. This year, you clearly intend to make quite radical changes to the budget, and that's why we can't just operate as we normally would, and why it does need to be settled earlier, because we're, we don't know what our spending is. Normally we would know. if We would just know that you were trusting our decisions and not making huge changes but it sounds like you do intend to make huge changes and so I know that does need to get settled before we get too far into the budget year I do agree with that if you want to leave the budget relatively stable then you could extend it into August I do think it is very unfair for one of the trustees not to get a chance to put in input but uh, but the, there is also the possibility that she could uh, you can still make changes to the tentative budget appropriations right. ordinance on the Wednesday before it gets voted on, and so I would certainly suggest that you have a period of discussion before you pass that tentative ordinance so that she does at least get a chance to say her thoughts at that time. So the tentative ordinance is the date of the board meeting? Correct. Okay. But then can't we still change it before the final 30 yes. days later? You okay. can, however, if you make radical changes at that time, that would not be very appropriate in life. Because basically you would be, you pass the appropriation ordinance here, the public has 30 days to inspect it, then they have a public hearing where they get to tell you what they think about your budget, and then if you totally change it after that point, that that's... Without, you know, if it's not reflecting on what they said, that, that would be very problematic and unethical. I was thinking in 30 days if we came up with alternatives that could maybe reverse some of these numbers or better these numbers. I mean, we can't touch it. No, you can't. It's just you, you wouldn't want to, to pass the tentative one and go, but oh, but we're going to totally change it for the final one. Oh, no, no, I didn't yeah. think that. But I okay. thought maybe we could, you know, 
make some changes. Oh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not right. talking drastic. I'm thinking because the more time allowed, maybe you know it'll end up in a different situation. Right. And well, and sometimes our numbers change in between those two. It's, that's that's mainly where their changes made. Well, I have a thought. Why don't we just present the original budget to the vote on Monday? On the fourth. Well, to start from the beginning, put a, the original staff budget. Well, that wasn't the purpose of all of no, these days. No, and that would defeat the fact that she and Joe went and did all that they did. Well, that doesn't matter because it's got no validity. They're right. They're, they're recommendations. They're only recommendations, so we don't want to see them on the next budget. Well, realistically, realistically, whatever. you know, based on everything that we heard the past three days. I did find these workshops to be very informative, I think. I think we all I learned a lot so. of things I thought that so. we didn't even expect we were going to learn. I and we did learn a lot of things. Yes. And many of them were um, contrary to what was given to us. Can, can you please quote to John? I'm sorry. Um, so uh, where do we stand with these budget dates? So we'll be back here on the 14th. What about Trustee Keen Adams? Or are we looking? I don't think she can. I will look up whether she can participate remotely, but I don't know if she wants to. Yeah, that's really not question. what I wanted to do on my last night of vacation. Yeah, I will consider it. Did you want to um, submit any? Absolutely. Okay. So um, we're scheduled for June 14th at 6.30 to discuss the budget and come up with the ten come up with the tentative. We'll come up with the numbers that are the ones that are the tentative. Numbers. Is that how the okay that's the comment. Okay. All right. Um do I have a motion to adjourn? Yes. Second motion. All right. So motion. That's a new one. Okay. Thank you. The second and third workshop of the Niles Main district library budget is now adjourned. Shall we do a roll call? Yes, please. Yes. All right. Yeah. 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 Yes. 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 Thank mm -hmm. you.